Hello, 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 hello. I think that we are live. In case we are not, I'm going to say hello now again one more time. Uh, so hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. And welcome to DSL online version. This version should have been in person. But as things are looking today, we are online, and that's absolutely marvelous too. Uh, we still got a fantastic lineup for you all. I want to say a little extra welcome to anyone who might have joined previously on our conferences back in 2018, 2019. Anyone who has joined our previous online events, the last one online was in February. We had a hybrid one back in June. Some of you have might remember those technical slight issues we had. Personally, I'm trying to forget them. Uh, but what I do remember, though, is that we had a fantastic lineup. And as I said, we have another one today. Uh, I should start by introducing myself. My name is Luis, and I will be your host this evening. So I'm Head of Product Design here at YLD, and, uh, which basically means that I get to work very closely with product and development teams, designing and building and delivering anything really that's techy and digitally. Um, also, I work very closely uh, with, I have worked with closely with design systems over the years. I've been involved in a lot of design system projects. And uh, I also get to work with the community people at our company, and that's why I'm here. So I get the pleasure to be part of these meetups and webinars, conferences, etc. Very cool stuff. So as I said, last time we had some fantastic speakers. I just want to give a big shout out to the people who spoke then. Francesco, who talked to us about the first design system ever seen on screen as teletext. Uh, we had Andre, who was talking about building the design system as you fly it and Jenny, uh, all the way from the other side of the Atlantic, uh, talking about navigating the politics of design system, and Jules, uh, who was talking to us about the post-design system world. Uh, and that's a world uh, that you might wonder, do I want to live in a world like that? If you are wondering that, why don't check out all of these talks on our Design System London YouTube channel, the same channel that you are watching this very live stream on. Um, so as I said, we do have a fantastic lineup today, and I am super psyched to say that we have four fantastic talks by six, and yes, you did hear that correctly, we have six speakers here today, uh, they should all be talking to us about various aspects of the design system. Um, our first speakers are going to be Catherine and Jana, two software engineers who are going to talk to us about the design system, what, why and how they are doing it on their playground on the project that they're currently on. We have Dan Donald, who's going to be talking to us about baby steps to the utopian dream. Sounds very exciting. And we have Luke and Marco, for, uh, who's going to be talking to us about aligning multi-theme design tokens, access design co and code, uh, sorry, across design and code. Uh, always love a collaboration between design and engineers, and uh, that is important. And last but not least, uh, to wrap us up today for us talks, we have the Design System for Smaller Organization by our second Dan, Dan C, Dan Cork. As I said, fantastic lineup. There's going to be a lot of interesting learnings for everyone to take away. So before we get to our talks, though, we do need to go through some logistics. I always say this, you wouldn't be a real online meetup without some quick logistics. Uh, I need to mention the code of conduct that you can find in um, the uh, live stream on the YouTube, you can see that on the chat, I think. Uh, just to kind of run through that quickly, for uh, it's the general stuff, just be, keep your language clean, be kind to each other, nothing inappropriate, and uh, yeah, just as I always say, generally good life advice, really. Um, for those of you who have not been to a live stream on YouTube before, there is a section for conversation that you can see, so please keep that conversation going. Uh, if you want to, of course, uh, you might have to uh, log into your, a Google account, uh, but keep it clean, keep it friendly, keep it going. If you hear anything that you think is super exciting, why not comment on it? And also, why not share where in the world you are joining us from just to get the chat started? We have had in the past people from Lebanon, from Canada, from India, Sweden, Spain, uh, South Africa, all over. Uh, I think we had someone from Singapore as well last time as well. So as you can see, this is quite a worldwide audience. So let's see where we land today. If you have any questions for our speakers, which I'm sure you will have, because the talk's going to probably nudge your brains and thinking and, you know. So we also have a Q&A section that you can find on the slider deck. Uh, there should be a link to the slider deck. If you receive an error or if there is a code, then le please let us know because we do have that as well. The Q&A will happen once all our four talks have been completed. 
that means that you ask a question to one person and you get response from everyone. So it's going to be an interesting conversation. When you post that question, please bear in mind who is it for, just to make it a bit easier. And as I said, we do have two dance today. So we have Dandy and Dancy. Okay, so I've been rambling on a lot about who I am and the speakers, and let's quickly talk a little bit about DSL or Design System London. I'm sure you all know who we are since you're here, but just in case. Design System London is formerly Digital Product London. Uh, our aim is to gather digital product minds to explore and explain and discuss challenging concepts from product design to engineering culture. Our main focus at the moment is design systems, but other product topics are also welcome. Um, yeah, so we are going to explore things coming up in the future as well. Uh, I have some exciting news at the end of this uh, meetup, so hang tight for that one. If you think that you want to bring your organization closer to the community, maybe you want to host an event, uh, in-person events, now that we're back to doing that, or maybe you want to sponsor one already, so maybe you want to speak even then let us know. Uh, we will we'll share a speaker form as well for anybody who wants to feel like, oh, I've got something interesting I want to talk about. Um, you might think, well, hang on, I never spoken before. Uh, will I be able to do this? Do you know what? That's the good thing about the community. Our aim is to allow anybody to speak. As you can see from today's lineup, we actually have some really seasoned speakers and we have some new speakers as well. And that's what we love here at the ASL. We want to give people a platform to be able to share their opinions, insights on the sun system. I even believe that we have had actually some peeps who have gone from visitors or viewers and become speakers. So it, it is happening and uh, we very much encourage it. So we wouldn't be able to do these uh, meetups, whether in person or whether they are online without our sponsor. So I want to say a massive thank you to YLD, who is our sponsor behind us in organizing it. And I think this is a great time to let somebody in from YLD actually to say a couple of quick words around what YLD is and uh, what we're doing at YLD. So I would like you to welcome Amelia. Uh, Amelia, I believe you are ready. There we go. There she is. I yes, shall hi. go off and let Amelia take over here. Hello, lovely to see you all. And thanks, Louise, for that introduction. Um, yes, I'm Amelia. I'm the head of people at YLD and we're sponsoring this event. Um, I really just wanted to give you a brief introduction to who we are um, before some of these really awesome talks begin. So we're a software engineering and product design consultancy, um, and we've got a, a quite big and diverse range of clients, and we work on different projects. Um, we try to help them improve their digital and technical skills. Uh, we're only able to do that thanks to our collaborative team of software engineers, product designers, QA, and platform engineers, and our team's really focused on finding creative ways to solve new problems and really leaving the client in a better space than they were before by sharing our knowledge and that you hopefully see by us sponsoring events like this. Uh, we have three offices uh, and our staff can choose between working in London, Lisbon and Porto or you can work totally remotely or a little bit of a hybrid of both if you'd rather. We're always looking for good product designers and good software engineers. Um, at the moment, we're looking to hire platform engineers to integrate into our PERM team. So um, not that I am really kind of plugging YLD as a place to work, except I am, but please come and have a look at our current roles that we have available on our website or share it with a friend. Um, you could also leave a message here in the chat window when the Q&A comes up. Uh, so yeah, have a look at our LinkedIn page and we'd love to hear from you. Or even if you just like to have a chat and find out a bit more about what it's like to work at YLD. Uh, so that's it from me for now. And I'll hand back to Louise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amelia. Excellent plug there for YLD. Um, all of this information will be in the chat. Um, okay, so uh, let's move on from that. Uh, I am actually also going to give a quick shout out to our partner, News UK, who was supposed to host the event in their beautiful offices in London. 
Uh, I want to thank all everyone from Music UK for all the support leading up to that event. And we can't wait to actually have the event in person. It is going to happen again. Don't worry. We are going to have it uh, and it will be announced at some point very soon. So do keep an eye out for that one. Just as a reminder, when we do in-person events, we are still live streaming them. So even if you are based elsewhere, you are still able to uh, enjoy the speakers. So I am going to have a quick look over at the chat and see where we have people. We have people from London, obviously, fantastic. We have people from Germany so far. A wave hello from the Netherlands, uh, which is awesome. So we do have some people so far, mainly in Europe, uh, for anybody else who's watching and haven't announced where they are, let us know. It's always interesting to see, uh, to keep that conversation going. Right. So we are here for the speakers and the talks. And I think before we even start with the talks, I think it would be lovely to actually just maybe have a quick chat to all the speakers. So this is the moment where you see how many fantastic speakers we actually have. So I'm going to ask everybody to come in here and say uh, a quick hello. So let me see here. We got, there we go. We got, we got Dan C, we got Dan D, we got uh, Jana K, uh, we got Marco and we got Luke. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so you can't all speak at the same time. So exactly. So I'm just going to wave at you and say, I hope you're doing really well. Uh, I do have two questions for each of you. Uh, I am going to start by asking, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you based? What are you doing? Are you an engineer? Are you a designer? Where are you working? What kind of projects are you working on if you are? Um, that's going to be my first question. And I am going to just democratically start by somebody who's appearing first on my link. So uh, it's going to be you, Kat. Catherine, how are you doing today? And where are you based? Hi, I'm doing well. Um, I'm actually based in California in the United States. I'm a software engineer. I work at Candy. And I've been a software engineer for about 14 years now. That kind of ages me, I guess. <laughs> it just shows how time is flying when you're having fun. Thank you so much for being here, Kathleen. Uh, next, I'm going to jump over to uh, actually your speaker partner, with Jana. Hello there. Hello. Um, I'm not based in the US, as Kat. I'm based on the Isle of Man, uh, which is probably somewhere around the UK. Um, I'm also a software engineer, and I work at YLD, but I am working with Kat on the same project with Kanzi. The beauty of working remote. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jana. Uh, next one up, we've got Luke. Hello, Luke. Uh, hiya. Uh, I'm Luke Finch. I'm a, a product designer, but I sit across sort of design and engineering these days. Uh, I've been working with Marco over the last couple of months doing some uh, paper plugin development. Uh, and yeah, I've been at Luke UK for the last five years. Um, building, Brilliant. Building, Thank designing. You. Did this excellent, awesome. Uh, in that case, let's uh, have a quick hello from your uh, your speaker partner, Marco. Hello, Marco. How are you? Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm good. Uh, yeah, I'm Marco. I'm a software engineer here at News UK. I'm based in London. Uh, I've been in London actually for six years. I'm from Italy, and yeah, I've been working at News for three years and been working in the News Kit Design System, having great fun. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That leads us with the two dads. Uh, so we're going to have Dandy coming in first. Hello there, Dandy. Hello. Um, so, yeah, I'm Dan. I'm based in Manchester in the UK. And for the last two months, I've moved to work at Zero Height as a de design advocate. So just spending time talking to people, writing blog posts all about design systems. Before that, so I you're was... basically doing work right now is what you're saying. This is work. Before, before that, I was um, an auto trader as a front end lead and then became content and experience lead. Fantastic. Brilliant. I'm glad that this has worked for you. Uh, it's not a bad job to have. So excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, last but not least, uh, Dan C, how are you today? Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm good. I am good. Um, yeah, I'm I'm based down uh, in the southeast of England. So uh, whenever I tell people where I live, I, the easiest way to explain it is uh, where the tunnel goes between the UK and England. I'm I'm on the UK side, well, not literally in the whole like about five miles away from it. Um, yeah, like similarly, my background software engineering, so like 14, 15 years, um, similarly quite old or feeling quite old. Um, 
and yeah like so I've always like loved design and kind of dabbled in design a bit and so that I now are working as that UX engineering lead and what really excited me about uh I'm, and I'm a little bit sad that I didn't get to be in a room full of people that would understand what my job title means because uh probably like many of you when I have to explain it to my parents or my family I just say uh, stuff with code and design <laughs> like that's the only I like, don't go much further but yeah quite excited to be uh, virtually in a room full of people who understand what I do. Yeah, I think we can all sympathize with that. Uh, my parents still think I work in IT. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, whatever that means to them. So, Dan, you don't actually live in the tunnel. You live on this, in southern uh, England, close to it. Fantastic. So, my question to you guys is, uh, how did you all get into design systems? What were kind of your first... As a, toe in the water, your first experience with it. Um, why don't we do this in reverse order? So let's start with you, Dan. Back to you, Dancy. Oh, wow. Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know if there was really like a, a kind of lightning moment. I think I've always been a, a kind of lover of design. Like I was self, I self taught myself to code and at the same time was kind of dabbling with design, um, but was never really good enough to be a full, full product designer, if I'm honest. Um, and yeah, like even back in my early kind of PHP days, I was doing st stuff that was kind of like a design system, but not really because I didn't know what that thing was. So I think it was kind of just a natural progression. And as soon as I found out about this thing called design systems, I just leached onto it with uh, everything I had. I never Brilliant. That, that was another age thing there, PHP days. Uh, just just pointed that oh, yeah. out as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So Dandy, uh, being an advocate, obviously you live, live and breathe design systems right at the moment. How did you first come across it? Uh, yeah, so I spent the last five years at Auto Trader, and it wasn't like a design system that suddenly happened. We tried a load of sharing projects just to try and get things more joined up. So you know, just sharing a bit of CSS here, getting the design libraries more in order. So it was more of an evolution of just trying to share stuff better. And so eventually we ended up with a design system. Fantastic. The uh, um, essence of it, sharing things better, getting a better combination of people understanding. Brilliant. Um, Marco, what's your uh, port into it? How did you get started? So it really just happened, to be honest. I'm a front-end engineer, so I was definitely looking for something where I could contribute for design, creating components that could be shared. And yeah, for an amazing role here at News. And yeah. Awesome, thank you. That's also good. And now, sorry, I was just trying to find a mute button. This is a classic, classic call. You've got to, you've got to struggle a little bit with that. Otherwise you don't know if it's live or not. Uh, so jumping over to you, Luke. How did you get into the whole design system thing? Yeah, I mean, similar to Marco, like sort of fell into it a little bit. Uh, I think uh, it's probably about, like four or five years ago we sort of noticed that um, everyone was doing very sort of similar work, and it's like how can we how can we line that thinking up? I sort of like sketch library started becoming a thing. We sort of evolved very like sort of rapidly as a company. Um, I'm not traditionally trained in design, so my background's in film and film production, uh, and I think there you've got kind of like really sort of like strong pipeline work of how you sort of operate and just trying to apply some of that knowledge of um, pipelines and systems in sort of our ways of working and how we sort of turn design into a system. Wonderful. It's still a creative thing, but I found that really interesting. Uh, Science thing, architecture. I'm an interior architect from, from that's what I trained as. Very similar again, not really that, but sort of system-wise, definitely works. Um, Jana, how was it for you? Well, for me, um, design system is actually what brought me to coding because I used to be an architect and I usually was very curious about the design systems and colors and everything was like responsive, but I wasn't able to code properly at all back in the time. So the design system was a very cool way for me to combine architecture size about the pixels, unfortunately, sorry guys and be able to code and do the front end design and just like enjoying the field. So that's what's happened to me. Fantastic. I feel like I jumped a the gun there when I said architect. So that was uh, excellent. It's a, it's a nice segue there. Thank you for that, helping me with that. Uh, so uh, last but not least, Catherine, Kat, how did you get into the whole thing? Yeah, I guess same with Dan C. It just kind of fell into my lap. Um, it's just, I've been into it for about a year now. Um, 
you know, the the developers were writing code over and over, and I really enjoy the systematic way that a design system brings to a company. Um, so yeah, it's really organized and yeah, I love it. Love that, fantastic. So um, thank you so much, guys. Uh, we're gonna have you come back one by one as, as this present this in a minute. Before I do that, I'm just gonna take a quick look at the comments and I have, I have got a comment in my in my periphery that I am going to bring up. Uh, so I have been asking you guys, how did you get into the design system? And someone rightfully pointed out that you don't get into the design system. The design system gets into you. So I should have asked the question, how did the design system get into you? How did it, how did it find you? Uh, for me, my segue was Lego. Uh, for those of you who don't know, which is probably most of you, but you might have seen me if you see me in person. I've got three Lego tattoos. I've always loved Lego. And uh, when I first uh, came across design systems and I realized the small components, the thing that you can build, what you create with it, how useful it is, it kind of stuck to me. But yeah, it was, uh, it, it's sort of that sort of area. Um, looking at the chat. So this is, this is, thank you so much all speakers for now. I'll see you all very shortly. Um, so I'm just going to have a quick look at the chat again for some destinations. Uh, we have some hellos from India. So it's spreading. Uh, hello there from Estonia. Hello, Estonia. Hello, India. Uh, and yeah, and then this amazing comment. So please keep the chat going. Please keep the comments going. And if you feel that I am not using the right expressions, I am very happy to be corrected because you're absolutely right. The design system gets into you. All right. So I think it's time for us to get started and kick off with what we all came here for. Um, I just want to rem remind everyone that we do have the Slido link for uh, the questions for all the presentations. We are going to bring back uh, some of our speakers. Their first talk today, design system, what, why, and how of our playground. And I would like to welcome both Catherine and Jana. The digital stage is all yours. Take it away. Thanks. Thank all you. Right. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to start off. Um, this is a talk basically for anybody at any level of design systems, um, kind of introducing what it is. So basically what, why, and how about how we do the design system. And Jana will say why we called it our playground. And we call it our playgrounds because we believe that the design system should be fun and it should be a great experience. So that's why we call it our playground. So let's jump right into it. I'm gonna talk about three things, um, the what, the why, and the how of design systems. Let's start with the what. Uh, so design system can be defined as many different things. Sometimes they're synonymous, synonymously used with three different things like the style guide, the pattern library, and the component library when in actuality, it's all three things. So defining a style guide, it's basically just a document that guidelines each of the repeatedly used elements. Um, it also includes um, visual identity, the icons, typography, and colors. And most importantly, it brings a common language for product owners, designers, and developers. Uh, so moving on, a pattern library is kind of similar. It's just an organized set of reusable components. So it's it's either code or it's design, either one of them. Um, and it's pretty much just the Lego blocks, like Louise said, of uh, design or, or component design. Um, we use atomic the atomic structure. So, you know, from atoms, molecules, organisms, uh, all the way up to templates and pages. Uh, what's cool about the pattern library is there are no rules that dictate how it's assembled. You can put it together any way you want. So that's what's uh, very simple. It's just a strictly functional, a functional element. Uh, so nothing else to add on it. No, no uh, business logic or anything. So the component library is pretty much a combination of everything. It's also reusable components, but it's the style guide plus the pattern library together. Um, having a component library, the design and development have a head start, so they don't have to rewrite code over and over again. There's no one reinventing the wheel. The code that goes into the system is reviewed and improved, so that way uh, 
you know, you can be sure that whatever goes in there is, is solid. Uh, so I gave you a, a definition of design systems, but I, I really like baking. So I always liken everything to baking. Um, I wanna kind of give you a better picture of how a design system is in the real life, I guess. So if you think of a style guide, it's kind of like the recipe book. The recipe book kind of tells you guidelines on how something should be created. Not necessarily, you know, exactly how, it's not necessarily the components to build, it's just kind of like a guide. And when you take a look at the pattern library, it's your very basic elements. So it's your sugar, your flour, your butter, eggs, and there's no real way to tell how they should go together. I guess that makes a good baker, that tells a good baker from a bad baker, however you put it together. So I think our component library is pretty good. Um, you can put it together and make a cake, donut, muffins, uh, crepes, or a croissant. Uh, all of those, all of those combined create uh, all of the basic elements combined create these pastries. So uh, that's what's uh, cool about having a design system. If you take a look at the cake by itself, you can add you know all these different flourishes. CSS is what I call this flourish, so that you can have different variants, and all those variants live in the component library. So all of those things together make up a, a whole cake. And we have so many variations of the cakes. Hope that kind of clears everything up. And now Jana is going to talk about the why. Now Jana feeling very hungry after all of the recipe cookbooks, but I will try to explain why. But before I will start explaining why, let's imagine that we will ask product design and development teams stick together in the same room and look in the same website. In our example, we will use OpenSea website. The chances are they will start thinking about absolutely different things. The project will probably start thinking about how to generate the revenue, how to attract different users. Design will most likely start thinking about the pixels, colors, pagination, and other bits, which again, um, and development will start probably thinking about the functional part, how to pass the data, how to enable search, how the buttons needs to work, and etc. So really, because they will start thinking about the different things, they would not know how to communicate together. And eventually their communication will hit the wall. I mean, currently it will hit the door, but the difference not that too much. Um, so me and Kat, we created the common language for this type of problems, whereas the product design engineering and even the project management will be able to communicate um, why the design system, the documentation and the TypeScript is also additional bits that they know how to, what to expect, how to communicate. So um, we are trying to really solve the common problems for the product owners, designers and developers. It's a streamless workflow, it's much higher efficiency, easy onboarding process, less time and cost in developing and creating, and also a common language. And it's very easy to hand off to design team, to developers, to products, and a very fast delivery to production. So we don't really need to spend so much time trying to reinventing the wheel. But there are so many libraries already available. Why are we using yet another one? Because they're all unique, and our one is unique for us. It's unique uh, for Candy. And this is how it works in Candy. Yeah, so I am not going to do a deep dive on, on any of these topics, but this is how we do our design system at Candy. So we use React with Next.js. On top of that, we use something called Stitches, which is really similar to styled components or emotion if you're familiar with that. Um, then we have uh, documenting tools and development tools like DocuSource and Storybook. Um, and something unique is we also use a CMS. Uh, just if no one else is familiar with React and Next.js, it's just an open source JavaScript library. And Next.js is a framework. And what's cool about it is it allows server-side rendering and it generates static website. And right off the box, it allows for strong typing. So. Another thing for communication is, you know, having a TypeScript so that people know what kind of props to put to pass into the elements. Um, I really love Stitches. 
Citrus is a really lightweight performant JavaScript styling library, and it has a focus on the architecture and the developer's experience. But why we like Stitches is there are three, three things that um, we found really useful with it. And one is a theme token. Uh, they also had really good variants. And we also need to use themes at Candy. And the reason is because it's good for scaling. So basically, a theme token is a reusable CSS variable. Um, it can be used throughout, throughout the whole app so that developers or even designers don't have to remember exactly the hexadecimal codes to it or even what font weights go where. And what's good about this is for, for our team, we're developing this language with, de with the design team. So we know exactly what color means what. So it's exactly in the code, the same color as it is in the Figma design, for example. Uh, what a theme token looks like is this. This is how um, theme tokens look like in stitches. Uh, so you don't have to remember all those things. It also has variants. So imagine a component. Um, you want to change this component a bit. You can add a, do, an, a, a new variant to make it slightly different. So it's the same component, but it has an appearance of the secondary uh, variant. Uh, so it just looks like that. That's how the, that's how the syntax might look like. Stitches also makes it easy to theme, and it makes it easy to theme multiple brands. So what we need to do at our at, on our project at Candy is we need to scale so that multiple brands have their own unique themes, and that's why Stitches makes it really, really easy. So it makes it easy to scale. Um, I'm just going to flash a screen of what syntax in Stitches might look like for our for React. Um, not going to get into it, but it, it looks really similar to emotion or solid components if everybody is, if anyone is familiar with that. And yeah, this is just what it might look like. Feel free to go to stitches.dev and learn more about it. I'm gonna pass it on to Yana. Yeah, um, as Kat already mentioned, we are using to um, document, uh, we're using DocuSource, which is a documentation for the pattern library. And we're using also the um, Inasa documentation um, library. But let's just talk about the DocuSource for now. The DocuSource is the used especially only for the pattern library. It's just the um, cat um, recipe cookbook, flour and butter is what it's used for. Um, the, it uses MDX. If somebody don't know, it's just the markdown uh, with the JSX. It's very easy to um, read and for the developers, it's also great because we can use the actual code. And this is the library where it's uh, the whole design system, the pattern library lives in it. And it's a single source of truth. It's a great communication tool for the design team, for the development team and the design team in, in development team. So that's just a quick example of me and Kat, amazing pattern libraries, partially our playground, where uh, on the left side, you can see it's a um, Kat cook cookbook uh, with the ingredients. This is our components. And on the right side is the same thing. It's the button with a different variant. So the idea here is we don't need to create yet another button. We're just changing the color by the changing the variant name. And this is how it works. But I mentioned the and Kat mentioned the storybook. What do we do with it? Because we already won design system documentation tool. The storybook if home is a home for the component library and the component library is much bigger. It's a tool for UI development and the communication tool again, but for the bigger picture is being used broadly by the design team developers. And it's more like mm, a cake, muffin or croissant. This is where we are documenting our croissants, how, how it's needed to be used with the toppings on top of it. So um, to just recap, um, the developing with the design system, um, we have a pattern library and I'm so sorry, I'm not using the recipe book right now. Let's just be a bit more precise. We have a pattern library, small box. It's just a image button box, nothing really complicated. It's just a dummy component itself. The component library uses the composition. The composition is pattern library blocks built together, and it makes it very simple to use. And we're using the TypeScript 
there on this level. So the developers know exactly what to expect from the component, as well as the testing documentation will use the same properties, the same parameters, and of course the CMS, but that's our secret for a bit. Um, so if you look on the right side, the variance, it's, we call them appearance, is actually the same component, but with a different toppings. That is what makes our design system great because we can use the same single source of truth, but we will have a different results for, for the website, for the web experience. But what about CMS, Kat? Yeah, so in our company, we have a unique tool, which is CMS, a content management system. Um, it's used by business. And what's important about this is that it connects the design system with content. So that way, product owners or site ops doesn't have to go through development to change the to change the content on the website. They just go directly to the CMS. How the CMS connects is there is a CMS, there is the API that connects to the CMS, which connects to our app, and the pattern library and the component library both feed up to our React app. So it looks like that. I just want to show you a quick example of what it might look like to have a CMS and the design system. So if you look on the left side, this is what you might see if you're familiar with WordPress or something, um, just some forms where you can add content. So the heading maps to the heading component in the design system. The description maps to a subheading in the, in the design system. You can choose colors from the themes so that it's restricted for whatever colors we add to the CMS. So they can stick with the theme, uh, whichever site they're on. And you can even have CTAs, so however much. Um, so one more section. I know we talked about three sections for the how, but a bonus section is the dedication. You need to have people dedicated to the design system in the company. Um, I saw a talk on YLD by, I think it was Jenny Mullis. She talked about the politics of design system. And it's really important that product design and development all follow this design system structure. So we have a common language, so we all work together. And it starts from the bottom all the way to the top. Everybody has to have this uh, commonality in order for us to progress. So it's important to have a dedicated resource. And to recap, I talked about the what, we talked about the why, and we talked about the how of design systems. So bringing it all together, we will um, show you just a quick example of how it might look like. Um, using the pattern library um, as a smaller blocks is just, again, image block, buttons, wherever it is, the recipe cookbook. Then the small blocks growing into the composition is a more complex components, which are then being used inside the sections. And again, because we are using the types, we are using the CMS, we don't actually need to change anything inside the code. The design system will handle that for us. And that creates an even bigger picture. We can create the templates. And the greatest thing about our design system is developers don't actually need to touch the templates itself to be able to build the different variants of the pages. The CMS and the design system is allowing the product or even designers or somebody who's working in our team just to be able to change and test the page itself and making sure that the business is very happy. So they would know that the product design and development can communicate together. They can be happy about designing and building the new features in the web pages. So to recap, the product will be definitely happy because they will have their users and a very quick time, the design will be able to see what they actually wanted to see. And development will be very, very happy about the whole progress and be able to deploy to production very, very quickly. So they all will be very, very happy and they will definitely live in harmony. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much to the both of you. Uh, for anyone who has a question for Kat or Jana, please uh, remember to use the Slido. Uh, I will see you guys back later for the Q&A. Um, 
before we move on with our second speaker for this evening, um, I had a quick look at the chat again, and we have some. So we have a hello from Belgium. So I just want to uh, recognize that. So that, that's growing, which is amazing. I also love the fact that we have a record back to one of our previous talks and speakers, uh, which is always lovely to have. Uh, and uh, obviously there is jokes. Uh, there are some, uh, I know that we had one of our speakers telling us what they're currently doing, what their background is. Did I mention that they were also a comedian? So for those of you who didn't pick up that, do have a look at the chat because there's some proper jokes in there. Uh, we had some great comments. We are sharing those comments on social media, which reminds me, we do need to do a social media plug because otherwise people don't know we exist. So if you see something that you think is good or fantastic or funny, why don't tweet it? Or if you see a clip, uh, yeah, share it uh, with the rest of the social media world uh, using our hashtag, hashtag DSL, hashtag Design System London, and of course, any general hashtag Design System you want to spread the word. If you're not following us already, it's uh, at DSLConf. Um, so definitely check that out. This should all be, I think, be appearing in a chat very close to you very soon. Okay, so now that we have that, I think it's time for us to welcome our second uh, speaker, speaker, singular, uh, this one. Uh, there he is, it's Dan. Uh, it's Dan D. Welcome. The digital stage is all yours. Uh, let me just see. Yes, I can see my slides and I'm assuming everyone else can now. Excellent. So you can't have a talk. Well, I can't have a talk with a normal title. It's got to be something slightly ridiculous and bombastic. So hopefully you've got your attention. And I think it's going to lead on nicely from um, what the other guys just did. Uh, click on the right thing. Yeah, so I'm Dan, and as I said at the beginning, I've recently started working at Zero Height as a design advocate, which basically means I'm just trying to find ways to listen and support the community all around design systems. So doing stuff like this, writing blog posts, one-on-one -on -one conversations, whatever it might be. It's really fun, I've got to be honest. Um, and Zero Height itself is a design system documentation tool, so it, it syncs up with various design tools and your code all in one place, like a CMS, um, which is very cool, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here to tell you that design systems solve all your problems, because we know that. You just get one off the shelf, you plug it in, and everything's fine, which means I can leave, because it's sorted. Really, it's three main areas that I want to talk about. And I'm used to pacing around a bit. So now I've got a standing desk. You're going to see me wobble all over the place. So we're talking about uh, soaking up all the great stuff that's out there, finding your own sense of direction, and just recognizing that change isn't always easy. And you'll see all these amazing things out there. But any change is good, any forward momentum. We're kind of spoiled in the web community in a really, really good way. There's just so many people with that are really, really clever in all kinds of aspects from design, development, products, testing, infrastructure, any of this stuff, and everyone wants to share. It's just the best place to be. And so it's no different in design systems, where although the term has been around for a while and some of them are really quite mature, not very mature these days, there's still so much to learn. There's so much to challenge and twist around and think about different angles. So we're spoiled for choice with so much to absorb on a regular basis. And it always feels a little bit overwhelming because what if someone has an amazing idea that you read about on a blog, um, like Nathan Curtis there with his naming tokens in design systems, and you look at what you've done and go, oh, maybe I've done it wrong. And it's hard because what is the right way? It isn't an off-the-shelf thing where you just go, oh, I do it like that and it's all fine. That's not real. And when you start looking around and say, well, there are a lot of really, really nice design systems. Some of them have great brands, funny or intelligent names, aspirational names, and you go, I want that. I want our design system to 
a beautiful typography and a personality of its own so people will just know that we know what we're doing and it's still scrolling there's quite a few of them and this is by no means comprehensive right everywhere you go someone uh, some company of any size is going to say ta-da here's our amazing beautiful design system and on the whole they all solve similar problems with different angles about what's different to them exactly like uh, Kat and Yona were talking about before is where they had a set of problems and have their solution it's still a design system and now how do I skip the video yes they're all amazing all of them it's not easy making a design system because it's not just designing some components it's not just writing a bit of code there's all of the people stuff that goes with it there is so much that is invisible about design systems and that's hard when you look at all these examples and go oh we could just be like material or carbon or any of them you don't see a lot of it so it's the same sort of thing as on instagram where you see someone's good side you see the shiny bit you see the bit of their lives that they want to share in a way a design system that's public facing especially is very much like that you've got all these really well documented well described components all these great brand guidelines you don't see the pain that went into it which sometimes can happen those challenges where maybe you have some dead ends maybe it's difficult to get buy-in maybe you're just told not to do it maybe there's a whole load of failed attempts before the one that you see so i think it's really important to understand that all of these great things are good for influence you can look at them and go that's really cool what they've done there and then try and unpick it a bit most people are really good at blogging about the process but the ugly side of it is really important to find did they have a really hard time selling it in and getting everyone to adopt it maybe they did i'm sure it wasn't plain sailing so it's trying to pick out of these great examples which are all brilliant in their own way what is it about them that you really like what do you think might help you it's so more than anything it's trying to go these are brilliant examples and we have a sense that a design system will help us but what is your north star and so you can easily point at one and go yeah we want that it's not a great place to start why does a design system solve your problems is everyone clear about that why do this at all it's a lot of investment there's lots of people that maybe need to change what they do there's a lot of internal stuff you might have to juggle depending on the size of your organization so being clear on what success looks like for you is really important i mean there's probably some metrics you can get your hands on maybe it's more uh, qualitative and you just want to go do people like it how do we measure that uh people actually using it then what is a meaningful metric there are things you can go okay a good thing would be let's just start with our buttons it's a classic example what does it take to make all our buttons use proper stuff from the design system maybe that's the first thing just ways of slicing it where you're quite clear on a short-term goal that feels attainable and that north star which is about your problems so before diving into right we know we need a design system we're going to take influence from all these amazing things just want to rattle through some of these areas that might not be too obvious so when we say previous experiences it might not always be at your current organization it might not always be with design systems it might be that people have tried a component library or something like that and maybe they've had a bad experience maybe they found some dead ends themselves it just makes sense in some way before committing to a solution to ask around and try and work out what expertise or experience do we have that maybe isn't obvious 
maybe from someone who works more on the infrastructure side, there's something they can really offer that you wouldn't have thought about if you're coming at the problem from the design angle. It's trying to get a rounded view of, does anyone have any experience, any encounters with a design system? Doing a retro if uh, past versions have been tried, just try and work out, well, why did they go wrong? Can we be honest about that? And leading on to that is the fundamental thing. Design systems are a people problem. The, the components can go through. We know we've got talented designers, we've got talented developers. But all of this stuff around communication and collaboration is all people stuff. We need to be clear on it doesn't happen. And it's not just the people designing and coding it. It's all of that area around it, the immediate team. Maybe it's a huge enterprise place and there's a multinational organization structure. So before even writing a line of code, do we have an idea of what that looks like? Who needs to be involved? Who needs to be aware? Who do we think might have a fair challenge or a problem with it? That helps us give some sense of reality to the project before it exists. Who might be needing a bit of persuasion? <laughs> Who might be super excited about it and be a great advocate for you? It's trying to get a rough idea of where are the challenges? Is this going to be an easy sell? Is there a department that needs to be involved that isn't obvious? All of that kind of leads to governance, which is a term you often hear around design systems. And it's kind of a, a catch all sometimes. So a colleague of mine wrote a great blog post about it. The short thing is, whatever your structure, maybe it's an ad hoc team, maybe you've got a dedicated team, maybe it's federalized all across product teams. How do you make decisions? And that might be, a change of tech or design. It might be down to someone's contributed something. How do you know it's done in the right way? How can you review it? And so as things change, how does that governance process work? How can you communicate it to everyone? So governance and people are very much the same sort of thing. It's easy to kind of forget about this stuff and jump straight into the details. So it's kind of interesting when you talk to lots of people about what they think a design system is, because sometimes it can be, uh, maybe someone's actually created a UI kit in Figma and they go, here's my design system. And in a way they're not wrong. Although you might say it's a UI kit, that might be the scope of their design system given their context. It might be that you say, all right, we're a design led organization. And so, our design tool with some documentation. That's the scope of our design system. Maybe there's just loads and loads of engineering teams all using different tech and you have to deliberately scope it. That's fine. As long as it's clear, that's what you mean by design system. And ideally, very much like the demo earlier, it should be seamless. So from problem space, through design, through documentation, through code, it's the same thing. And we're really clear on the problems that all of this stuff solves. So we lean into workflow a little bit. So <laughs> this was for an article I wrote about workflow. So I don't expect this slide to make sense. But the yellow one there might be an oversimplification of a product development process where we've got a problem space, the product owner works with a designer, maybe a BA, whatever you're configuration is and you go through an iterative design development test iterate kind of cycle and eventually you end up with a live product so how might you factor in the impact of a design system what if you i don't know you've got a new problem to solve and 90 percent of it's solved by the design system but like 10 percent needs something new what do you do that relates back to governance where you're saying, okay, so I'm a person in a product team and I've noticed a new thing. How do, how do we do that? 
do I just make it? Do I tell somebody? Is there a workflow I need to do myself? And just, you know, through a few post-its or stickies, starts to unpick some of that of what is the impact for an individual on our particular flavor of design system. And likewise, at the bottom there, with the uh, bug reports, triaging the issues and that kind of thing, that takes time. Who's going to do it? Because you, you'd hope that over time, the design system and the components would mature, but there's always going to be a snag or something at some point. So we come to baby steps. You've got all of this kind of North Star, the goals, the rough idea of we want to try and get here and we're clear on the problems that we're solving for us. So how do you do it? And I think part of it is when talking about the workflow and the governance, all of that stuff, it's easy when it's greenfield in some ways, because at least you can go, okay, well, we'll have a workshop. We'll get some people together. It's still possible when you already have a design system. It can be harder. But spending that time thinking about the people bit, the governance, the workflow, it's never too late. And you never know what it's going to throw up. You might find that there's workflow improvements, trying to open that circle around it so more people are aware. Maybe you change your comms strategy. There's loads you can learn. And so, Change with intent is a really powerful thing. It doesn't have to be huge steps, as long as they're a positive forward movement. <coughs> Excuse me. And so with design tokens, if you're not familiar with it, they're essentially a design decisions stored in JSON files. And so with this example here, I'm using the Figma tokens plugin. If you think design tokens might be interesting, it doesn't mean you have to do a whole reorganization, a whole restructure. But if you do it with intent and think, well, let's try it. How much do we need to do to validate the approach? And so if you use something like um, the variables you saw before, you can get that from tokens, from design tokens into those variables. So it might just be changing the workflow. How do we get from a choice in design through into the variables that are React or whatever needs to consume? So you're yeah, obviously going to use zero link, but you might start off with no real components and to say, okay, we've got a tool for documentation. You can start by talking about the workflow and the government stuff right away. Whatever you use for documentation, this is a matter of capturing why are we having a design system anyway? Are we clear on that? Who needs to be involved? That starts to become, it could be the source of truth, but it's certainly the single destination where everyone knows, go to this address, you'll see exactly what's in the design system. You can read about brand, the design system project. You can see the code as well as the design. And it starts that setting of expectations, I think. So <laughs> there is no utopian dream. It's just one of those things where you see a new shiny and you think, we should have that. But it's trying to find that balance between what, is, what are your problems? How far do you need to go with solving them? And how much influence can you take from someone that's got a really mature system that's probably been through a lot of pain and try to be quite clear on where do you really need to get to? It might not be a big shiny thing. It might be solving your problems in a way that's just right for you. That's all I've got for you. I know it's a lot of rambling, but feel free to follow up on Twitter if you want to or in the chat. And yeah, thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, that was fantastic. Very, very good. Uh, if you have any questions for Dandy, uh, then add that onto the slider as well, and we'll come back to that afterwards. Then I should see you at the Q&A later. Uh, awesome. Um, having another little quick look at the chat. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. We are actually going to move that into the slider deck and come back to that question. Uh, 
we are we getting some love here for the speakers, which is amazing to see some great support live. So that's brilliant. Really like that. Uh, okay, speakers. As I said, I think it's time to bring up the next slide. Uh, and for this one, if I remember correctly, we do actually have two. So let's uh, welcome Luke and Michael. Well, hello, uh, you're, back, you're on stage. Hello again. The digital stage is all yours. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Much. Um, let me just move my tabs around. There we go. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today in the live stream. It's uh, a shame that we couldn't see you all in person. But uh, yeah, here we are uh, in the digital stage, as uh, Louisa said. Um, uh, I mean, we've already done intros, but again, I'm Luke Finch, product designer here at News UK. I've uh, been working across multiple titles over the last five years and we sort of stu got stuck in with the design systems uh, team. Uh, and I've been working a lot on like thicken plugins and some of our workflow. Uh, and Marco? Yeah, I'm a software engineer at News UK. I'm based in London. I uh, moved to London about six years ago, and actually before doing coding, I worked in hospital for a year as a nurse, and then I decided to switch to something I actually did enjoy more. And yeah, now I've been working at Newskit for about three years, and that's basically what we're going to talk first today. If you go to the next slide. So today, Luke and I are going to talk to you about a solution we are implementing in our organization to align multi-team design tokens across design and code. So first thing, we're gonna have a little intro about Newskit, a little overview, challenges we have faced to move teams to code and the solution we are working on. So next, uh, Newskit. Um, yeah, next one. So for who doesn't know, for who doesn't know, Newskit is a design system we build and use here at News UK. It is open source, it's built for everyone. It's a teamable design system for unique media brands. We do really care our consumer to be able to really customize our components. Currently, we offer about 60 high quality and accessible React and Figma components. Uh, we are supporting we are supporting a multitude of brands across News Corp. And on the right hand side, you can also see a little showcase of some of our components, which you can definitely read more on the newski.co.uk website. Next. Here in this slide, I want to show you an example of the power of Newskit teaming. Our design system, as mentioned, is highly flexible and customizable. On the right-hand side, that's a GIF from Figma. Here we are using one of our tools, the Team Swapper. As the name says, it allows us to quickly, in a few clicks, change from, from a team to another. And even though the components are the same, in this example, they do have their own identity and branding styling. That's one of our missions. Next. Every design team at News owns and maintains their own team in Figma. The teams contain all the tokens, color, font sizes, spacing, and so on. Then for implementing those, we codify the team into JSON format using some handmade tools so the team can then be implemented in our products. We have quite a few tools at the moment which needs to be maintained, such as the team exporter, team swapper, illustration exporter, However, the process currently we have on for creating teams, changing them, and quantifying them is quite convoluted. Has a bit of high learning curve, and our design system is scaling. We're working with multiple teams now. So the current way of working doesn't feel sustainable. Lots of, lots of time is being spent on boarding, and overall, it's not a great experience. So today, we are going to tell you how we want to improve things in our organization. So we want to create the foundation for unifying those tooling into one, creating our own Figma plugin so everything can be seen and done in one place, improve the speed up of onboarding process for new teams, make it more intuitive and scale easily with many more teams. And especially we want to empower designers to create teams and make changes easily and quickly. We want to free developers from some of those tasks so they can focus more on features implementation. Now I'm going to hand over to Luke, which is going to tell you more about our planning. Uh, thank you, Margot. So, I mean, all good missions have to start with a plan. And so we came together to start a working group out of our design ops Slack channel uh, to build a, a plugin design uh, group, essentially. Uh, and from there, we looked to get feedback from our end users through um, things like quarterly surveys, our design development clinics that we run, 
and our support channels through Slack. And like one of the great things about working internal tooling is that all your designs are in-house. So, I mean, it's a bit harder now that we're remotely, but usually you can go over to somebody's desk, ask them how they're getting along and get really quick feedback. And so we were able to decide what's like really important to us there and how we could build a robust solution to streamline the whole process across designing code. Um, we looked into solutions like Figma tokens, which you uh, may have seen a little bit in uh, Dan's uh, slides earlier. However, we found that this wasn't sustainable for us um, in being able to support multiple design libraries without us having to uproot our design system. So from all this planning, we had a clear understanding of what would not work for us and our users. And we have to build out some requirements. So here it was really important for our designers um, to use just one plugin for all the interactions with the news kit and see everything in one place. Designers had to have the right tools at their hand to consider, confidently own their theming process. It was also really important that developers knew what tokens were being used to make designing, uh, implement these designs as easy as possible, and to know when a theme would change so they could update it in the code base. So we do that by keeping all of our design data in one place and we fill in any gaps that are missing from Figma. So things like preset values for sizing, spacing, border radiuses, etc. We keep everything in sync through GitHub so we can check changes and notify teams. And we control the quality of our output through validating our data. And so with those requirements, we decided to build two applications to effectively move our design data from our designers to our engineers. And we decided to build a Figma plugin uh, that provides an interface for our designers to be able to edit and apply their themes and design tokens within Figma and send those changes to Publisher. And Publish is an application that uses Style Dictionary and Circle CI to transform all of the data that we get out of the Figma document and transform that into news to get ready code, which we can then publish to NPM for our developers to implement in their applications. So firstly, about the plugin and how it works. Uh, this is an overview here that's kind of showed you um, how all these elements are interacting with each other. So the Figma plugin runs inside of the Figma editor, and this is where we store all of our designs, um, all of our theme files exist in Figma. And the plugin launches an iframe that shows our plugin UI. And this is all sort of built and designed using NewsKit and all of our NewsKit components. Um, and from there, designers are able to make changes to their theme within the UI. Changes that we make in that UI are then passed back to the Figma document to update our design libraries. And from this UI, we're able to send the updated theme objects to the publisher. And so uh, thanks to James Newsom for these designs uh, of uh, where we've got to with our Figma plugin. So this is all designed and built using NewsKit. So it's really exciting that we're at a point where we're able to use our design system to build out new things for the design system. And what does this give us? Um, it gives us everything in one place. So uh, to steal a previous metaphor, if you're baking a cake, you want to weigh out all your ingredients before you start cooking. So designers are able to see all of their themes and have a visual representation for all of their design tokens. We can save time by having everything available to us immediately. Uh, so you've got every, every possible design token that we use in code is available to us inside Figma as well. And this gives us easy ways to edit. So now tokens are able to reference each other, um, like Figma styles, a, a static asset, but here we can reference each other. Um, so you can textual colors, uh, you can see they're like inconformative, it's referencing till 60, um, and those work dynamically. We're able to validate those user inputs to make sure that the themes are always working. We can preview our changes so that designers confidently know what they're doing and how the knock-on effect of changing a value affects their theme. And we've also been able to simplify the handover process here. So previously we were um, exporting out JSON files that was zipped and then sent over Slack to a developer. Now everything's done through GitHub. Uh, we create a pull request using a form inside of the plugin. Uh, it goes to GitHub and we use that for source control. And all this theme data is then prepared and sent to the publisher through this pull request form, which Mark will now tell you more about. Thank you very much, Luke. So let's talk about the publisher now. Um, before going into details on what happens next, let me refresh you what the publisher does. So it has the purpose of processing a team's token set received by the plugin and transforming them into something digestible by your application. At the moment, and in this case, you are converting the team's token set into a new skit team format, so it can be used with new skit components. And lastly, the publisher makes the team available to consumers. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide. On the right-hand side, you can see an example of the team sent by the plugin and received by the publisher in form of a GitHub pull request. It holds metadata and a property with the team name and all the tokens inside. Tokens staying all at the same level, 
At the moment, as you can see, we have only colors here, but we will have everything, color, font sizes, font families, shadows, and so on. But as mentioned before, this structure is not compatible yet with NewSkin, so it needs to be transformed. Let's have a look at this diagram. As mentioned, the pull request will be created, and then the designer will be reviewing the, the pull request with the new team object, and once happy, we'll merge it. That's when the magic happens, and when CircleCI, a CI CD delivery platform, orchestrates everything. First thing first, some validation jobs will run. You run tests, linting, for example. Then we process the object to receive the plugin using style dictionary, a very powerful tool which allows us to support even more formats in the future. And once the team object has been processed, we run a handmade script which collects all the available specific brands, teams, and then deploy the collection to NPM, becoming then available to our consumers. Next. That's finally when team, the team you modified uh, from the Teams plugin uh, can be implemented in your application. <clears throat> and this happens really in a short time, a matter of minutes since the merge. Developers can now import the chosen team from the package, compile it with a new skit create team function, and pass the compiled team to the team provider component. All the new skit components inside will then make use of the Teams tokens and reflect the design values for each brand. Next. Here, an example on how your product might look different simply in changing a team. We do support a very detailed customization of components. And again, in Newskit team, you can change color, font sizing, spacing, typography presets, and so on. The components can really look very different. We are really satisfied with what we've made and achieved so far. We have simplified the process by providing an intuitive interface for managing our teams. We feel like we put back the power into the designer's hand, now having a full ownership of the team process. And again, developer's intervention is now even less needed, and I can focus more on building and implementing features. And we definitely do see lots of potential. It's a solid foundation to build upon for future. Now, Luke is going to tell you more where we are headed. Uh, thank you. So yeah, as Marco said, we've, uh, we've got a really solid foundation that we can now sort of build upon. Uh, one of the things that Newsk is looking to do uh, in the coming sort of like months is looking into multi-platform support uh, across iOS and Android. So we currently only support web, but looking to how we can like leverage style dictionary to be able to work across iOS and Android as well. Uh, one of the things that's really important to us is getting as close as possible to a one-to-one -one linking between figure and code uh, by being able to support uh, what we call style presets uh, in Newskit and being able to support those inside Figma almost like a composition component uh, style at that point. Um, but you need to like automatically show design tokens in our handover documentation as well. Um, you know, it's still sort of the bane of any sort of designer and engineer is that handover documentation and being able to like smooth that process as much as possible. Uh, and we're also looking into um, fully streamlining our support for text crop within the publisher. Uh, currently, all of our components are using a plugin called text crop, which I developed. Uh, to support all of our typography, um, we need to be able to sort of like support that properly in the publisher. Um, if you're interested in helping us uh, on our mission and the future of Newskit, uh, please do get in touch um, if through the News Careers or Newskit UK. Uh, there's also a couple of emails there. Uh, and Marco and I and Newskit Design are on Twitter, so please do reach out. Um, thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions uh, for Luke and Marco, please use that in the Slido. Uh, we have already some really great questions, so I can tell you halfway through uh, that we are going to have an amazing Q&A. Um, so I wanted to check in as well on the chat. Oh, I am loving the, the love for the speakers. It's very nice to see. Uh, Great presentation. Yes, that was a great presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, for those of you who are interested in knowing more about um, the new UK design system, I would love to reference back to a previous talk from one of their colleagues that did a talk for us at the DSL back in December. And as always, you can find all previous talks on this very YouTube channel. So do check that out as well. Uh, now it's time to move on to our next speaker, and we are calling in Luke. 
no, we're not calling. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I I am messing this up. We just had Luke and Marco. <laughs> Our both speak. We are obviously not do that. We are calling in. Uh, sorry, I completely lost the plot now because I lost my papers. And this is how you know it's live. Uh, we are calling in the second Dan. This is why. Thank you. And Dan saved the day by actually appearing. Just magic. I got very confused like there for a second. Yeah. I was like, have I Obviously, changed my name? All I got very confused. Um, I confused myself and I confused everybody. And thank you, Dan, for saving the call day. Call me Luke Here if you want. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to have to no, apologize I, as I, well. I, if, I, I Sorry. think we should give I think we should give Luke and uh, uh, Marco a rest now uh, to the QS. Yes. Dan, we are super excited <laughs> to hear your talk. Uh, we have heard about larger organizations and how they do it. You are going <laughs> to tell us a little bit more how to do it for small organizations. The digital stage yes. is all yours. Thank you very much. Let me do a classic share my screen. Um, yeah, apologize if you hear any screaming or banging. Um, I have a four year old child who is right above me and is currently uh, having the hugest tantrum in the world about going to bed. So uh, just in case you hear any weird noises, I, I promise you that my house is completely normal other than two young children. Um, cool. Yeah. So thanks for having me today. Um, yeah. There's some really absolutely wonderful talks and hoping uh, I can continue that. So um, yeah. So design systems for smaller organizations. If you have, like me, been in uh, been in the team building design system for its early stages, or you have been involved strategically at all, you've probably had discussions with people about uh, viability and affordability. And something I've heard far too many times um, is this kind of notion that design systems are just this luxury for large organizations. Um, and obviously, I get where people come from with this, right? Like larger teams have and large companies have deep pockets and they can invest more time in it. But I disagree uh, completely that, that it, is, it is purely a luxury for them. And hopefully I'm going to be able to convince you and explain why. So, uh, yeah, as I introduced myself earlier, I am Dan. I am working as UX engineering lead. Um, I work for a company called Unit 4. We build a suite of kind of enterprise software, um, things for like finance and human resources and that sort of thing. Um, now, obviously, in what I've just said, some of you may have clocked that I said the word enterprise and that this talk is about smaller organizations. So prior to joining Unit 4, I'd spent the previous years um, working in, in startups slash scale-ups. I never know when, when a startup comes to scale-up um, and working on design systems from the kind of ground up. And it's since moving into kind of the enterprise world, I've taken some time to reflect on the lessons I learned whilst I was in that kind of space. Um, and, you know, but lessons based on the successes, but I think more importantly, the failures, right? Like, I think it's really important that we embrace our failures and, and, and learn from them. And that's hopefully what I want to share with you today. So um, unsurprisingly, I'm going to start with stakeholder management. And uh, you know, I think pretty much every talk has kind of alluded to this in some way. Um, you know, we talk about it, we, we often use the term buy-in and it's, it's all about having one or hopefully more people who are above you and really believe in what you're doing and will champion this. So how do we achieve this in a smaller organization? Well, first we need to ask ourselves a question. Why are design systems great for smaller organizations in, in specifically? So obviously we, we all know the benefits of, um, of the design systems. You know, we've talked about May today. Um, but what particularly uh, about them is good for smaller organizations? Because if we can't answer that question, then we aren't going to be able to sell it as a val valuable use of, of time and money. So for me, having reflected, I think there's two key areas where, where smaller companies can benefit. Um, the first area is in prototyping. So we know that small organizations often don't know their market fit yet. They often have to test ideas. So maybe they build a new module or maybe their whole product is, is kind of an experiment. And for me, that's where a design system can thrive, right? Um, and often in, in, in for, for startups, especially, if you look at their product offering at in, from launch compared to say two or three, 
years down the line, it can be completely different. So that ability to, to move fast and to adapt priorities is, is super important. And, you know, as we know, a design system can support that and it can support it whilst delivering high quality. Um, the other piece for me is how it optimizes tasks. So if you've worked in a startup or, or a scale up, you'll know that like the hierarchy often inside the organization isn't that well defined. Um, I don't mean there isn't, you know, there isn't, isn't hierarchy at all, but I mean, often you'll see situations where um, people in leadership positions will actually be doing part of the role of an IC, mucking in and kind of getting their hands dirty. And so when you've got this situation where people in leadership who should be organizing are, are actually doing some of the work and the company is moving fast, it can be really hard to coordinate efforts. Um, and that's why if, and, and I guess this is probably isn't just a problem for small organizations, but it's definitely kind of, I think, exacerbating that in that space, um, that you end up with teams repeating tasks, right? Teams building the same button, teams building the same pieces of UI repetitively. And that obviously in a smaller company, that's a big, big cost because that's a big chunk of their wages being used repetitively. So if we can sell this, how can we make it succeed? Well, for me, I think the biggest learning um, is to agree a long-term vision. And I think this is to not only manage the stakeholders' expectations, but also to manage your own because, you know, we are... We, we tend to meet ups like this because we love design systems, but we've got to be realists. Um, we've got to make sure that everyone is on the same page as where we're going. Because if we've got this grandiose idea, but our stakeholders don't, then that lack of alignment um, will just cause frustration further down the line. Um, and there's plenty of techniques for doing this. Um, in a startup, I think the, the two kind of options are you look at, okay, well, what if the organization was say three times the size what sort of design system, what sort of team would be needed to support that and, and work your way backwards. Um, alternatively, startups that go through funding rounds, you could think in, in that way as well. Um, probably the biggest uh, thing I learned is, is that once you've agreed that vision to write it down, it's very easy in these companies to kind of have meetings, have conversations, and because there might not be many of you, that it's very easy to assume right think it's been discussed everyone was in that meeting assumed but things can change over time leadership can change resources can change and priorities can change um it doesn't mean that when you create a long-term vision it has to be set in stone it's more just it gives a reference point that you can keep coming back to and just ensuring that everyone's on the same page with where you are and, and, and where you're going so what should this look like Firstly, unsurprisingly, resourcing and, and hiring. Um, if you've been involved in the design system from an early stage, you've probably been told, oh, is this something you can do alongside your normal work? And I think I think all of the three talks have said, uh, alluded to this, no, it doesn't work. Um, often when that happens uh, and someone else has then the conflict of, of product work versus design system work, the product work will always win out. Um, and that's not for, a, you know, that's not for any in like malice intent. It just is the truth. Um, and it, what it means for the design system is it won't get the same attention it needs when it comes to governance. And, and, and you know, Dan said, the other Dan said it as well, that, you know, governance is, is super important. And I, I found it especially so when you're in those early stages of, of building a design system and, and trying, to, trying to get the wheels rolling. So secondly, um, is agreeing a roadmap. And I've seen a few times that when, when, when I've had discussions around this, people tend to focus on the quantity, how many components, uh, you know, how many tokens, how many components. And for me, I don't find that very works very well. I think what's more important is to go back to that piece around like the buy-in and the value that we added to the company and focus the roadmap around that. Um, it's quite tricky to do, and that's why it goes kind of hand in hand with the, the next piece I was saying, which is uh, about metrics, right? It, it's very important that, you know, and, and leadership will be very, very on your tail about this uh, from experience, that metrics are, metrics are super important to be able to actually prove that 
you know the value you've said you add and, and what you're going to do will actually deliver what you're promising um so for me there's two elements of this there's there's the successes and the failures so when you have successes and your metrics can prove that shout about it sing about it you know it's it's wonderful when that happens but equally when you have failures it, it's important to turn those to your advantage right don't hide from them the worst thing you can do from it is, is hide from them um it's important to know when something isn't working to embrace it and actually show that you're being proactive and, and moving onwards from it. So the next thing I want to touch on is advocacy. Um, as we all know, like we love design systems and if you work in a design system team, it can be a little bit of a bubble. It's so important when you, to have advocacy. And by that, we mean people around the business who are also spreading the love and believe in what you're doing. And this is so important to its success. Um, Often when we talk about others in a business being involved in the design system, we tend to go towards the notion of contribution. But oddly, and actually quite surprisingly to me, I found that adoption was more important, especially in those early stages. Um, having a design system that is being used and used throughout a product, it really, really increases its value to the company because if someone in a leadership position wanted to ditch the design system, it would suddenly produce a lot of design and technical debt, which is much less likely um, to happen. So for me, having fewer components initially, but having that greater adoption is much, much better than having a, a suite of components that are just sat there gathering dust. And it, it kind of goes to supply and demand, right? If you have less and people are using it heavily, that will create and generate demand for more. And that is a good way, it's a good then selling point onwards um, to leadership to say, we need more people. Um, so yeah, rather than that notion of completeness, I think it's important to prioritize what the users actually need. So for me, like ambition is it important and, and having the ambition of not being the loudest voice for your design system. You, know, you will be the most, most knowledgeable person and the most passionate about it, but it really, really supports your cause. If in meetings, especially meetings you might not be in, if others are there singing the praises of your design system, because interestingly, you know, when you're, when you're singing its praises, you might be seen as a little biased, but if someone in, you know, someone unexpected, it does happen that you might find an engineer or a product owner who you weren't expecting actually really seeing in its design system praises. Um, and that's, yeah, that is super beneficial. All this though, all this kind of wonderful utopia uh, relies on trust, trust in, in yourself or, or your team um, and also in the design system. And trust is such a difficult thing to build up, but it's a very, very easy thing to lose. Um, Breaking changes, whether that be in your Figma design kit or whether that be in your code base, can really, really tarnish a person's opinion of your system. So, you know, if they perceive it as slowing them down, that is instantly going to put them on the back foot and make them think that this they question the value you're giving. So we need to think of ways and, and look for ways to obviously prevent this. Um, I found that focusing on the interface was a very powerful technique. So what do I mean by this? So in Figma and in, in our kind of UI design kits, I, you know, I'm talking about the naming of the components and the variants you supply. And in code, obviously, if we're talking something like React, we're talking about the component names in the props or CSS, the class names. Why this is important is because if you've got a really solid interface, what you put behind it can be a bit naff. Right? It's okay for it to, to be a bit naff and, and obviously not awful, but it's okay for it to be a little bit basic, maybe missing a few features that you can, you can iterate on and add with time. But if you don't nail that down, it's much harder, again, going back to the notion of breaking changes. It's really, really important, obviously, to seek regular feedback. Um, I mean, it's not just for design systems, this is any design, right? And, and any, any, any piece of work we do, like feedback is in, important, but from my experience in, in, a, in a small company, um, it, it's, it's important to listen and to be really malleable in terms of that roadmap. So what I was saying about like the number of components, to me, that isn't important. What your users need 
and actually listening and responding, it will really, really build that trust. And thirdly, um, involving others in your decision making. So those that might not even actually be the ones singing about your design system, bring them in, get their feedback and involve them in decision making process. And again, document those decisions. Um, it will really show the trust, right? Because it shows it will show that the trust is going both ways, that they can have trust in you and that you have trust in them to make decisions about something that they might, you know, obviously will perceive you as being more um, knowledgeable about. And so the third piece I want to touch on is um, education. And for me personally, the biggest problem I came across um, working on design systems in, in smaller companies is the definition of what a design system is. Um, you know, we've had a few people talking tonight and, and some really, really good metaphors, actually. I love, I love the metaphor of kind of like the recipes and such. Um, but I've had several conversations with people who have tried to tell me, you know, a design system is just a, a bunch of UI. It's just a bunch of UI components. Um, and as we know, there, there's a, a lot more to, to it than that. So how can we, can we solve this problem? especially in a small organization where people's time is quite stretched and quite limited already without adding to their load. Now, the obvious choice that people will probably jump to is, is workshops and talks. Um, and I don't want to discourage people from doing these because I think they are really powerful tools. But what I found, and I know I am fully aware of the irony of giving a talk, saying that talks probably aren't the best, uh, best routes to exchange knowledge. Um, but those who attend inside your organization are likely to be people who are already knowledgeable and already passionate or care in some way about your design system. Um, it's quite likely that you may not reach the people that you need to. And actually, when people um, need to go and, you know, people will have competing things for their time in terms of what they can and how much time they can give up. So for me, what I found much more powerful was the notion of, of pairing or in larger groups, mobbing. So there's two ways you can do this, right? You can bring people into you and support them and pair alongside them. This can be on design, engineering, or even across the crafts. So you bring them in, you help them to contribute. And then hopefully the, the idea hopefully is that they can go out when they work on their products and will sing your praises and will we'll spread and increase the adoption. The problem is it goes back to that thing of competing priorities for me that I found that people often won't then push it as hard as, as they possibly could. Um, and that's no judgment to them, obviously, like small organization, they have pressures on them to deliver product. So personally, I found the notion of, of kind of me stepping over the fence and, and supporting in the product itself uh, much more powerful. Again, it builds trust that you're willing to come over the fence. And it's, you know, it does sound contradictory to the points we've made today about a design system needs to be staffed if I'm saying step away from it and, and build, help build the product. But um, it, it, it requires pragmatism in a small company. You know, when you haven't got that level of resource, you do at times have to be really pragmatic to be able to drive that more demand. And as I said, it doesn't have to be limited to craft. You can support design, you can support engineering, um, you can support product. And... The only thing I will say to that is just be prepared to manage the kind of expectations and, and be clear about the limits of, of what your support is. You know, you don't want to make them think that you are full time now an engineer or a designer with them, but set, set the limit. Say, hey, I'm coming to support you on X or Y for this period of time. Um, and it will really help to pass on the knowledge, not only about the design system, but also about UI in general and about the kind of technical side of what we do. So I said those three points, but again, I think I can't remember who's talking, but I'm going to a fourth point as well. Um, and it kind of points back to that notion of pragmatism, right? It's probably the main attribute you'll need to have to be really pragmatic and understand kind of which hill to die on. Um, we all know what the best practices are for design systems, um, but it's likely you will have to compromise at times because... And this, I'm going to sound really negative here and really defeatist, but I'm, not, I'm trying to be really released it, that most folks in leadership won't care about the design system, not to the level we do, and not to the level we would need them to, to, you know, <laughs> to keep, to, 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 to allow for the full scope. So one realization I had is that it's kind of okay if the version one of your design system sucks. Like 
in a startup and scale up, as I said, the product itself may not be that well defined. So it's okay if the design system for that product is not that well defined as well. And if you look at some of the big boys that we will aspire to, you know, Polaris, Carbon, Material, none of them are on their first version. They, they are many iterations down the line and it would have taken them a long time. I think as Dan said, you know, like it's not easily and they would have done a lot of ugly things to get to that point. Um, and I'm a big, I'm a big fan of this. It's, there's this sort of phrase that's been used and turned many times. It's an old Italian proverb, um, the best is the enemy of the good. And it's sometimes referred to as like the 80-20 rule. Um, and it's, it's the idea that if you strive for everything, you will maybe achieve nothing, right? You really need to think about, okay, and it's, it's that notion of agile and, and MVP, right? That notion of what can we achieve and what can then we use to build on that? So it might be an unpopular opinion uh, in, a, in, in an environment like this, in a group like this, but maybe it's okay if all your design tokens aren't defined, right? Like maybe it's okay if you use a framework of some kind as a base initially, like if, if your users give you, as in um, by users, I mean like an engineers and designers, if they say, hey, you know, we're quite used to bootstrap or tailwind, it's probably okay to use that in, 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 your initial, um, in your initial versions, just to get the adoption and to get them on board. So I just wanted to uh, leave a few final thoughts and I really don't wanna end on a down note, um, but I think it's important to, to reiterate the importance of pragmatism and real, realism. If you are working in a small company or you know, are moving to a small company and, and want to kind of build a design system, it is very much achievable, but it's not easy. It's very hard work. Um, and one thing I learned is that it's important not to get too emotionally invested. Um, you know, we are here again because we love design systems. That's why I intend meetups like this and Converge next week. But for our mental well-being, for our happiness, it's important that we, we do treat it as work. Um, because as I said, things can change within a company. Priorities can change. Um, leadership can change. You know, it, it's quite likely in the downsizing that a design system team may be seen as a target to 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 go so you need to be pre prepared to walk away if it's the right thing for you you know burnout is has been a, a huge problem in our industry over the last few years and i, I guess this i mean this, this probably could be a, a a bit of advice for anything really but um you know i think it's really important that if if you if you are in that space for your mental well-being for your mental health that you are able to, to keep that distance and, and do what you need to do. I, by the way, I'm not advocating you quit your jobs here. That's not what I'm saying. It's purely about looking after yourselves. So on that happy note, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I uh, don't do many of the socials, but feel free to do any questions, obviously to ask me to QA or to add me on LinkedIn or some of the design systems that communities. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dancy. That was great. And I also love that there was some inspirational at the end, inspiration there at the end as well. Very positive notes to finish on. Thank you. Um, so if you have any questions for Dan, uh, C, uh, add them on to the Slido. We have some fantastic questions. Uh, we do have a, we are going to basically call everybody back in and we're going to have a look at those questions because there's a lot of them. And uh, so I hope all of you watching are ready for some fantastic QA. Right, co speakers, please uh, don't be shy. Come back in. Hello, everybody. Uh, right, so I am going to, sorry, I'm just loading up the slide there so we can have a proper look at all the questions. So I am going to go through them. Um, first thing I'm going to say is the first one here, but is this record, uh, is this session recorded? Uh, yes, just a reminder, as it said in the chat earlier, this is going to be on the YouTube, it will be there, it will continue to be there after this is over, so you can come back and watch it however many times you want. Um, so yes, 100%. So let's jump into the first question. Uh, let's get with you, Dan Donald. Uh, the question here is, how do you message success? I'm going to direct this question to you because it's directly directed to you, but I am sure that everyone will have an opinion on how to measure success. So you kick us off with that one first. Yeah, that's kind of a big one to unpick. And uh, it depends on the structure of your system anyway. 
And it goes right from what Dan was saying as well about like if you're a smaller organization or you're trying to go quickly all the way through to something gargantuan and you know the biggest of all enterprise things. It's less about what can you measure more than why would you measure it. It's like if you just because you can measure something, it doesn't mean it's telling you anything useful. And so be really clear on if you're clear on the problems your design system is trying to solve. That should try and give you some idea of what metrics, if you can get them, might help you to gauge, are we actually solving that problem? And yeah, Dan was saying correctly as well, like, you know, if you had a few components, but they were well used, that's great. And so if that's a criteria for success, then how can you tell how well used they are? Some of that's going to be quite ephemeral. Some of it you can probably just go, oh, you can get the analytics from here or here and probably pull it together in some kind of dashboard. So it's very, very much your mileage may vary, I think. Others might have different. So yeah, absolutely. It is difficult as well to measure because there's a different audience as well. It's not necessarily users that sort of public users. We have internal users, engineers, designers. Are they are they actually adopting it, etc.? Um, so I, I guess Dan, since since you touched a little bit on that as well, do you do you want to give us a a, a quick uh, run through of what you think is a good way of measuring success? Yeah, I, I think Dan kind of hit the uh, other Dan <laughs> hit the nail on the head. Um, so for me, like I found actually kind of feedback from people was just like I said, the most most important thing. So doing surveys um, and anything where you actually get like direct response and direct feedback, like that was the most powerful thing when I was able to show I found when I was able to show like, hey, like, you know, trust or whatever, Some, something like their opinion of X has gone from here to here um yeah that to me show was what's much more about much more a, a better measure of success than you know i've got 10 components now excellent thank you um i'm going to actually go to jana and kath i know that you guys are quite early on in the stages uh, and at this this stage where you are right now, have you sort of started thinking about how you're going to measure success or have you already sort of started to measure success as you go along yeah, absolutely. We it's the same thing as the two Dan said. Um, it's the main thing is adoption and kind of understanding. Um, so if the, the other developers understand what the components are used for and if they're using it, then I think that's pretty successful. Excellent. Yeah, and I, I am gonna sorry, go on, Yana. Oh yeah, I totally agree with Kat and also I think um Dan and Kat said that the design system is being used appropriately and it, it's able to scale and being used in the, in the multiple ways. It's also useful. Indeed. Brilliant. Um, so I am I am actually going to Luke and Marco last, uh, and that's because you have a slightly more mature design system. And um, I know from previous DSL talks that there have been some real efforts to measure success uh, of new uh, kit. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I can pick it up. So definitely, I will say, first thing first, it needs to be clear to us developer, designers, and product owners if things works, are clear and can work. Then we do lots of surveys. We do speak with our consumers. And yeah, we definitely have also some clinics, for example. So every week, we do have a meeting when people can join, tell us if things are working as they, as, as they wish. And recently, we are also investigating how to collect data uh, to see to see you know if, if the adoption is good or not. But definitely, people come first. And when you sort of collect that data, how have you guys defined what data it is that you're collecting? As I think, Dan, we, we mentioned here, it's, it's, you need to kind of decide what you want to measure. How did you guys decide? Okay. Uh, yeah. This yes. is the data that I'm looking for. Yeah. So that's something actually we are just starting now and speaking now. So we're really in early staging about collecting data. But for example, one useful graph I think we could have potentially is in how many projects a specific component is being used. So I guess we can see how famous, let's say, the component is. And maybe you can also see the drop of adoption of a specific component. That's something else potentially can give us some idea. But again, definitely surveys and speaking with people is the main thing. Yeah, um, just to add to, to what I said, um, 
one thing I found really interesting, um, so we're talking about metrics and everything here, but I found it really, really beneficial to jump on anything that was positive. Um, and just, just to quantify that, so I um, I remember there was a, a, a company kind of weekly meeting and people would do demos in it. And there was one week where I, was, I wasn't demoing anything, but there were four people, four people giving demos of things they'd done in the products and all four had heavily used the design system. So I was like, okay, I'm jumping on this and, and kind of shouting about it. And it's things like that, like, if you see something, and I mean, I guess for News UK and, and companies like that, like it's probably more obvious because obviously it's going out onto kind of a very public thing. But yeah, if, if you see stuff like that, don't don't be limited to your metrics, like jump on it and, and shout about it and scream because people need to know you're doing good work. Absolutely. Because uh, then you got to point out that someone else, it's not just you shouting about how brilliant it is. A very good point. Um, so you guys were talking about components and which components are successful and how is adoption going and should we have too many components so it's actually better to have components that are used so i guess this is the question for all speakers um how do you test individual components with users and and is that already at that testing stage can you sort of see like is this going to be successful or is it just a really bad component or, or yeah how do we basically test components with users jump on that one to kick things off i think like as a design system you've got like two users right um if like with, with things people sort of talk about like design systems or a product and you know they're almost like uh an internal tool so it's your first user is your colleagues and the people building with the system uh and there's like how do you measure that it's working for them uh and then you know then it goes to your end user of uh you know it's in the wild it's released at that point um, so it's almost like a, a chain of uh, feedback. So I think uh, I, I don't think it's quite clear the question. But uh, apologies, my doorbell's just gone off. Um, but I'm going to ignore it because I haven't ordered anything. Um, nobody talks to me, so uh, I'll carry on. Um, yeah, I think it. Yeah, there's two types of users there. You've got your internal users and then your external users. Almost. Um, I don't think um, when we're talking about like components in the wild. Um, testing those at a singular level um i think it's too sort of granular uh you know ux is some of its parts you can't just sort of like focus in very much on like does this button perform well it's you know it's always a contextual art um it's more that um yeah if you're sort of testing internally um does it does it do everything i need it to do um does it do everything that you need it to do um you know we've like at news uk we started working on um what we call like patterns, which is like um, compositions of components that do things for our users, almost like an agnostic um, white labeling of what we're doing. Uh, so working on something like my account or um, form journeys. Uh, one of my colleagues, Chris Hart, just released sort of blog post on how we sort of built out our um, form patterns. And so um, building a design system for building forms. Uh, and, you know, that goes through like really sort of like strict testing with users to make sure that what we're doing is sort of like best in class and works. I just want to add about testing with users. We do really also take lots of care about the components we build being accessible. So we also made some accessibility testing live with users and that helped us a lot. Yeah, it was very helpful. Excellent. Thank you. Um, if anybody else have any sort of input on how they measure uh, I think what you said, actually, I just wanted to make a quick comment on that. I think what you say sort of meshing on an individual level, I think it's very interesting that sort of, is that even possible? And, and do we really need to do that? Does it do what we need to do? How does it work with other components once you actually create something that someone is going to be interacting with? Um, very good point. Um, do we have any other comments? Yes, I mean, do we indeed? Dan, I'm going to do the hand raising thing because I'm polite. I think that's really great. <laughs> Go for it. Um, I was just going to completely agree with everything that's been said so far. But also add to the fact that if you're overly reductive about a whole design system and product development thing, you've got a problem space in live code. And so the problem is the real issue. If you've got lots and lots of different product teams with their own sets of problems, like Luke was saying, it's like when it's out in the wild, that's one set of users. And like the first time something is used in a given context, that's immensely valuable. It, it might tell you, oh, it, actually, we found a new requirement. It now needs to do this extra thing. Or maybe it's not actually the right component to be using. And so every different context, a button or something is used in gives you that extra either reassurance, this is good, people are using it, and they solved that problem really well for users. 
or we now have something to challenge it and make us reassess a little bit, which is really, really healthy. Excellent. Do you have any further comments on that? If not, I'm going to move on to the next question. We have a lot of questions, which is really exciting. And you know what? You can keep the questions coming. Uh, so, um, I, I think this is sort of a slightly broader question, I guess. Well, actually, let's talk. Let's go for this question. So, we're talking about the science system. We're talking about components. We're talking about small pieces. That kind of this is. I, I'm trying to get a segue here. So, bear with me, everybody. Uh, somebody was asking about the science system versus atomic. Is this uh, what's the difference between this and atom design, or is it the same thing? Um, I think a lot of us in this industry, we are very familiar with that sort of thing, but maybe just for, we have some people who might not be as familiar, somebody want to pick this up and just sort of have a quick uh, answer to that? Yeah, go on, Dan. Waving hands, it's working well. <laughs> I mean, it's a strategy. It's a way of breaking things down into smaller things, and you can build up layers of complexity. Whether you call it atomic or not, there's probably some flavor of it you're using. You don't have to call it a design system because you break things down a bit. Um, it's one of those strategies where it's a good shortcut. So if everyone has an understanding of what atomic design is, you could choose a different naming convention, but still use that idea of things being quite small and building up in layers of complexity. And so I'd argue, yeah, you can use atomic design if you just did CSS. Probably, maybe. Doesn't make it a design system but you could incorporate that as a strategy in how you structure your design system. So they can be the same thing. One can incorporate another, it's just a strategy. Excellent, I think that covers it. Yes, go on, Luke. I just wanted to, yes, yeah, sort of build on that. Yeah, it's like, it's just a mental model to help you. Like, it's, I think we use it as a communication tool early on. Um, the, you know, it's, it's, I think it's like the work that um, Brad Frost has done, like it's great reading, but you know, it's, as soon as you start applying it to a system at scale, you figure out if it doesn't doesn't work for you. Uh, you you move and shift, and it's what sort of works in context within your company, um, and who you work with, and what they understand. Yeah, absolutely, couldn't agree more with that. So we're getting nods from everybody. So there you go. That's a great answer for for all of us. So let's go on to the next one. Uh, we do have a question in the live chat. We are going to get that one translated to Slido, so we'll end up in the right place. Uh, so we come into your question for you and don't worry. Um, so we are, um, I guess I'm, I'm going to, this is a question for Catherine here. Uh, Catherine, uh, what tool, um, we're going to move over to a completely different area here. We're going to talk a little bit, but you mentioned CMS. So what tool did you use for the CMS? Is the CMS used for documentation? Yeah, so at Candy, we're using something called Strapi. And Strapi is a React CMS. Um, we don't use it for documentation, but um, I think Strapi is kind of like a bare bones CMS. So it's totally customizable. Um, that's why we use that. And it helps us connect to the design system directly. So it, it, everything is just um, customized by us. Um, there's nothing like that. You know, everybody's familiar with WordPress. There's no real WordPress because it's in PHP or React. But um, Strapi is the closest one, so that's the one. That's the one we chose. Excellent, thank you. Um, so back to you, Dandy. Uh, we have a question here, directed directly at, at you. Um, how would you go about ensuring parity between design toolkit libraries and the code base? Uh, I guess it goes back to some of the stuff I was talking about. Like that isn't a tooling problem or anything like that. It's just a people problem. And so if, if people aren't talking and trying to build up that shared language, that's when things fall out of sync. And so if you, however your structure is, you've got to somehow form a consensus. What are we calling this thing? What does it do? What is it for? Otherwise, you've got lots of handover. And every handover, there's an opportunity for something to cock up or go wrong. If you, if you can point at a thing and go, oh, that is a button. And so it stays a button all the way through the, the pipeline, right the way from problem to user. You've got a shared vocabulary there. It doesn't necessarily matter how you've executed it, so you know what you're talking about. So I'd just say, like, it's people stuff every time because you've got incredibly smart designers and developers there. Just talk. 
it's not an official communication tool. Exactly. Cool. Um, this is uh, so I, I find this question interesting because I I know we we talked about so news um, news UK yeah, news UK you're quite mature. It's quite a large design system. Um, you guys are talking about Candy. You guys are at the starting uh, uh, of it. Uh, there were small organizations. Um, design system, would you have design systems per product? Uh, yes, I can see Marco's brain here is working away. So I'm going to go first to you and then I'm going to go <laughs> continue from there on. Uh, yes, Marco, come in here. So uh, I think I think that really goes against what design system wants to be. I think like if it's supposed to be very flexible and reusable, I think a design system may be specific for products uh, yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't sound like, yeah, what they would do with that. I, I guess given flexibility should be one of the main characteristics. Again, I wouldn't have one specific design system for, for product. At least now I can think about an example. Maybe if I, maybe if I think about the metaverse, maybe you, we, we, might, we might want to have a design system for metaverse. Who knows? I know some people are working on it. But speak about web. I would say if it's very flexible, yeah, maybe not. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any other comments? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the key points of a design system is that it reduces repetition of the boring stuff, right? Like so. Um, there's ways to do to, to for a design system to support multiple products, multiple platforms. You know, like quite a few design systems will support iOS and and JavaScript, which are, you know very different languages and very different platforms, very different you know um, SDKs and things like that. So um, you know you can there's ways you can create a single design system that might have some things that are web only, some things that are metaverse only, some things that might be uh, you know. A, a digital assistant so I'm not going to say them because I'll set off about 20 in my house um yeah I think I think it's a case of using tooling and clever things to um so in my current company for example we're having to support like quite a range of languages things like that so we're, we're trying to use tooling so we don't have to write you know a view component a component uh, whatever a web component uh, CSS. So, and, it, and it's a case of yeah understanding and it will take a lot of work like understanding each product's individual needs and then bringing that back in and and architecting what that might look like. Yes, go on, Bandy. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I'm hogging the mic sometimes. Um, I think some of it is like everything set so far is legit. And I think the only thing you could say is if a product has a different requirement, a different need. Um, and again, if you assume that everything's white label and you, what you've got again is another solution to a different problem. If it's made in the right way so it's themable and all this great stuff that one product might have that need but then perceptually the all the other products then have access to potentially using this new solution and so they can diverge and you might just start off by saying this is intended for use for this product but the next product might come on and go actually that's brilliant can we have that too and because the design system hopefully is made in such a way you can theme it and and all that sort of jazz you get that joy of being able to share that solution. And like Dan was saying, you, you reduce the boring stuff and hopefully all the solutions get better. Yes, and I, I would say as well, just like, a, <clears throat> I don't know who asked this question, but it could also be as a, as the perception is that they're different, but they're actually not different because that's the, if you have designed a good design system, when you look at it with your naked eye, you don't actually know that it's just one system because it is well structured. It is it works across many different platforms or products in this case, as we're referencing here. But when you look at it, it looks like it's different, but it is actually just one design system when you sort of bring it back to where we came from. We come from the same source. And I think that's the thing with themes, like themes don't just have to be colors. A theme could fundamentally exactly. change a lot of the properties of something. So that button looks so distinctly different from the next, but it's the same source. Absolutely. Excellent. Okay, so we have covered that one. So let's see what else we have in our fabulous list of questions. 
So there was a couple of, um, the, we have a question here about open source design system and if that has done, if someone has done that before. So obviously you guys mentioned, I know for a fact that you guys, uh, this is, this is um, Luke and Marco, I know that your design system went open source not that long ago, if I'm correct. Yeah, that's true, not long ago, actually, yeah, just recently. And yeah, lots of, lots of components available. How did you guys feel about that sort of leading really? up to let's go let's go open source? How, yeah, really, the, uh... yeah, really proud, really proud. We did work a lot again. I joined News Kit uh, three years ago and have been have been years of work uh, writing nice documentation, testing and everything. So now it's really nice to be able to see other people using it, coming ask his question, being able to help them. Uh, definitely something that makes you proud. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations there as well. Uh, absolutely Thank worth you. the applause there. Um, so I want to ask uh, uh, um, Catherine and Jana, because I know that there is an ambition from your side. Again, what I found super interesting here is that we have a really mature design system. We also have a design system that's just starting sort of slightly earlier in the process. Your ambition here, if I understand it correctly, is that you would like to to go open source at some point. Um, how are you feeling? What what's uh, is there any? I guess there's a lot. There's a long way to go. But how are you feeling about it? Yeah, there is a long way to go, and and that is exactly the goal that we had in mind. I'm glad that Dan C wrote that in his um, presentation. That at first your design system might suck because that's kind of how I feel sometimes. <laughs> I just have to admit that, but um, it is kind of a goal. And the reason why for me it's a goal is that when you have that ambition that it's gonna become open source someday, you're gonna want your code to be pretty perfect. So having that in mind and developing your design system, I think it, it kind of keeps you on the right path. Indeed, yeah. absolutely. Yes, go Desi. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think um, I don't know if anyone's alluded to it yet, but one of one of the benefits of a design system um, is that it's a it's a window to your company, right? Like it's a window to your company's culture that not only have they invested in a design system, they're giving back. And so, I personally I, I would never want to work at a company that didn't have ambitions to 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 open source a design system because you know all the technologies that were mentioned today. I mean, React, uh, Bootstrap, Strapi, all the all these things, right? They're all open source, right? So we all use it. And so um, anytime I've had a discussion with someone in leadership around this, I'm like, it's 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 hypocritical, right? To say, hey, we'll use this thing that is other people invested time for free, but we will give zero back. You know, that's just an awful culture. Absolutely. I think that's a really fair point. Uh, Jana, what, did, did you want to add something there as well? Yeah, I wanted to just say I think it's a it's a lot of joy and I think it's a lot of ambition to to be able to open source and then the users will be able to people will be able to use it and then it's just the proudness that you build it and it is actually being used to give it back to the community to give it back to the users. So that's like me and Kat, we we are still at the beginning, we are still trying to enable a lot of people, but it's a we are looking forward to be able to open source it and um, make people a bit happier. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And ju just to, yeah, Perfect. just to add to what Yana said, and you know, a, a previous question is that how do you measure success? I think that's one measure of success. Yes, exactly. That, I was about to say absolutely, and you know, you guys are on your way there and measuring success on the way there. But the fact that it's going open source and people are using it, that in itself is another measure of success as well, and and and, and the adoption of that being out there. Um, so I, I'm going to go to a question, which is uh, to Kathy Yana here. Uh, so Stitches, uh, you mentioned Stitches in your conversation. It's still a fairly new tool. Uh, I guess this goes to anyone really, uh, not just about Stitches, but tool in general. Was it risky to pick up something like that? And sort of, did you have any problems at the beginning or, or for the rest of you guys choosing a tool and thinking, you know, oh my God, we don't really know much about it. How, how, talk, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I, and now I feel like I'm talking a lot, but um, yeah, so when we adopted Stitches, um, it it has a lot of similarities to existing style, 
you know, CSS and JavaScript like emotion or styled components. And there are little differences that I found were uh, a little difficult to, to change to. Like for styled components, you can pass in props, you can have functions within the CSS and JavaScript, but stitches acts a little bit differently. Instead, they give you an object variant, which you have to define. Um, so that's something that we had to do differently. And even themes, uh, that, that's something that um, we also had to kind of change. But what's great about stitches is it's really fast. It They um, help with server-side rendering and the developer experience with stitches is amazing. So I, I highly recommend it. Brilliant. Uh, do do we have anyone else who sort of have any input on a tool that they have chosen or why they chose that particular tool? If they have any nervousness about is this the right tool? Uh, if you don't have that, that's okay. We have we have plenty of other questions. Yes, uh, Nancy, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think similarly. I'm I had a thing at my previous startup where the the company was all using um, style components and. Um, uh, we picked up a new styled system and and uh, it was quite quickly deprecated because the guy kind of just gave up on it. And yeah, I think that's kind of what the question alluded to is like, it's sometimes difficult to make those decisions and then go with it. And, you know, like it was like, okay, if I went to the, the new thing and I'd have to switch to a motion or to get the whole company to switch to a motion. Um, I, I, I think it comes to pragmatism, right? And again, like it, it's okay, maybe in the short term to, to go to that as long as you manage that debt and understand that that's a problem and don't like go so heavily with a technical choice that you're completely tied in like at the end of the day stitches style components emotion i mean it's just css like especially if you use the template strings right it's just css worst case you could copy it all out and put it into into a css file um so yeah like it, it's, it's all about understanding the limitations of the technology and and what you could do in a worst case scenario go on Dandy. I was just going to build on what Dan accidentally put there. It's like um, there's these words like debt and risk, which are often dirty words, but actually risk is a really good thing to understand. And so like the risk of using a plugin or any particular technology is what, like how can you quantify that? And so like Dan was saying, you know, the worst case, if, if stitches were to just disappear, it's not the end of the world, but you can probably get a rough idea of what does it actually look like to replace it? So you can almost measure the risk there of, that goes away. What does that mean to do something else? It doesn't mean you've picked the, the next solution or anything like that, but you've got a rough sense of how big a risk is it? Are we talking one person for a week? Are we talking the entire team needing to drop tools and do this? It just gives you a rough sense, just a finger in the air of how do we think about this risk? Is that okay? Absolutely. Yes, go on. Yeah, just go just to follow on from that then. It's like a Dan Train um is that it, it go, what, what i said in my talk like if you document this stuff like the decision you've made and and you know the risk that, you, that comes with it and why you've made that it reflects really well on you <laughs> like it really does it really shows okay this person knows what they're talking about they understand the risk like that and they're owning it right like that you are you're owning it that 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 thing and you know if, if it doesn't work it's on you and you've then got a plan to to get out of it yeah, I couldn't agree more when it comes to tools. Uh, currently working on the project, we picked the tool, it, it, not around the design system, as well as CMS. It was an open source. We were very excited about this. It's sort of not what we need because our product grown and now we have to change. Do you know what? It's not what we wanted. It's not what we planned, but we are planning for that change and the change is going to be good. So it's going to happen. Um, so I'm going to try to segue here. Uh, we talked about you guys. Yes, I know <laughs> you're laughing. I, I, I am going to make this happen here. So plugins. Uh, new skip plugin uh i guess there's a good relevance here so what's the reason that you are using a custom solution for tokens instead of other popular plugins like figma tokens for example yeah i mean i also sort of sat there waiting for the segue to come through uh, um yeah it's i i've sort of written about it before and it's like is that level of risk um and like you know we're sort of big believers in like adopting open source when it's the right move for us um but yeah, you know, there's benefits to being able to sort of like own your own process. Um, so I guess I'm kind of like playing devil's advocate for these guys a little bit. Um, it is, yeah, like prepare for risk. Um, but also, you know, you learn so much from doing something yourself. Um, and every choice you make works for you. 
or will work for you because you've got the ability to change it. Um, like the reason why we went into Figma tokens um, at the time that like we sort of started this project, you know, it, like all this kind of started like in our sort of like design up Slack channel. It was like, hey, I've got an idea. And then um, Nick Dorman, who's our head of design systems, like, interesting. By the way, we're looking at Figma tokens. And then, you know, that sort of stems into a conversation. We sit down, we evaluate everything. Um, you know, you almost like write a pro con list. You know, here's things we really like, here's things we, that w wouldn't work for us. And one of those things at the time was we've got, um, we had about 10 different teams uh, owning their own sort of like design library that then supports multiple themes within that, that our system was already kind of set up um, in such a way that, you know, if we were to migrate to Figma tokens, we've got to inherit a load of work to make that work for us. And at the time that we looked into Figma tokens, uh, and I, I haven't looked at it recently, but they didn't support remote styles, that all of your design tokens were then sort of embedded directly in the work and file you were in. So like the whole idea of design tokens being something you can change in one place and it propagates everywhere. Um, that didn't kind of really work for us and like work with how we thought we wanted to work. Um, and then like we work on like multi brand, um, multiple themes and sub themes within the same file. The, um, so we work in like newspapers and each um, section of our site will be under a different sub theme. So you've got a top level theme that's like your newspaper. So it might be like the Times, for example. And then each section of the newspaper is branded its own sub theme where it's got its own kind of colors. So politics is like a sort of maroony red, uh, sports and green, for example. But those override our brand colors. But you can't design those in the same context within the bigger document. Um, I've just gone on a whole rant. But yeah, essentially, um, yeah, we decided to build our own system to make things work for us. Um, and it always just opens up to so much more potential doing it ourselves. Um, that you know you've got to we've got to work on the limitations of the figma api at the moment um and you know having a persistent plugin that's always open we can do more things uh you know you've got a window into your designers um design file that we can sort of like automate some of the processes there um that you know we couldn't expect other sort of like teams doing work to pick up um you know they are open source they're open to prs but you know you've got to go through that whole um process of getting your own ideas onto somebody else's roadmap that you know doing it yourself and building it to spot you can do what you want um and then you know, hopefully one day we'll sort of play it back uh, and give back to the community sorry that's a very long-winded question <laughs> a long answer to your question <laughs> no it was good i i guess it's it could it be a maturity thing as well where are you in your design system process how big is your organization what's your resources available you start with something which is uh something like Figma where, where you can utilize that. And as you say, as you grow and you realize that this does no longer fulfill your brief or your need, you start on something else. And so, you know, there, there is a process in there as well, I think. I think, yeah, that's kind of a big thing as well as like being able to like adapt to change. Um, you know, you, you buy into a system, you have to go through so many rounds of procurement, you know, there's like anytime you pick up somebody else's tool, Right, you've got to go through the whole legal process and paying that and you know convincing that this is business like worthy um and you know if you suddenly like if something changes overnight you know for example film just got acquired by adobe maybe this isn't the tool for us in the future how do we sort of you know move, move our system and like adapt overnight um you know being able to own everything that we do and be able to sort of uh, change rapidly is i think a big part of operating at the scale we operate at you know, we can't just shut down tools. Um, you know, we're supporting so many teams. Uh, I'm gonna let you in, uh, Dancy, because I know you wave. I, but I just want to comment that quickly, Luke. You said it. You're the one who first picked it up. I was waiting to see when someone was going to mention this, <laughs> I and I think bombshell. this was a perfect time to to mention it. <laughs> I was I I was thinking, should I mention this at this point? Is this exactly the scenario? What happens when something changes in a tool? It happens over now. So anyway, I'm gonna let you in, Dancy. You had a comment there as well, please. Yeah, I was literally going to mention the same sort of thing about um the, the uh, Figma uh, acquiring Davy. Uh, no, Figma acquiring Davy? No, that I mean that'd be ridiculous. Um, no, uh, with with Figma, I mean, like what I found uh, is that its API is pretty pretty good. <laughs> like, I mean, we know it's amazing already, but it, it's, its API is really good, and you can do a lot with it. Um, and you don't need to write a whole plugin. I I had it in my previous company where um we like 
I just wrote a really, really crude script. Like I would never let, if a junior wrote that script, I would have questioned it, but um, you know, it was that level of code, but it, I wrote the, like a crude script in about 20 minutes, just to pull icons out of it. You can do it like pulling SVGs, whatever, like, you, you, you know, you can write something that is cheap and throwaway and, and does a job in a short term um, without having to, you know, invest a huge amount of time. So obviously, UK, companies like UK probably would invest more time, but you know there are options that you don't have to go down this this kind of maintaining something for the long term. You can write something for a short term need, for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. and that's oh sorry, I'm interrupting you. Um, that's you know why we built two applications as well. Like having that publisher um, sits as a like a middle layer where we've got this like but it's like intermediate token format. Um, but you know I think looking at what sort of the W3 groups doing there with their sort of like new standardized design token format as well, probably something we'll look to adopt because uh, it makes sense. Um, but yeah, being able to not be dependent on one thing, um, you know, our circle pipeline, that would take any, any JSON data, spit it out to any platform. It's great that, you know, maybe we go back to sketch, maybe we pick up something else, like, you know, a new tool will come out next week. Um, being able to, yeah, pump data from one place to another as quickly as possible is what it's sort of all about. Yeah, uh, just to add- Go for Marco, please. Yeah, yeah, just to add, absolutely. Like, like we are building the plugin, so we definitely know how works, how works, how it's gonna work if you need to change platform. We definitely own the code. And as Luke said, the publisher, which is the second part of our tooling is agnostic. So it doesn't really care where the object comes from. It's able to take, you know, the, the, the JSON we want or potentially any JSON if we just adapt it and really give us what we need at Newski team in this example for this for this example or be able to support any platform it really doesn't doesn't matter. I think it's quite flexible. Something we really thought about. So I'm actually gonna ask a question, follow-up question on this. And this is only because we are now we do uh, Marco and Luke here talking about plugins and news. Um, Okay. Um, we have a question here, uh, open source, of course, yes, your design system is open source, but will a version of the plugin uh, uh, and what powers, if so, will be available somehow for people to use or document in some way? Uh, is that something that you guys are looking at as well? Yeah, absolutely. So as you said, the design system use kit is open source. This tool at the moment is intern only, so we have just uh, a very nice foundation uh, but is kind of tied up to our internal process, authentication, logins. Uh, but we definitely potentially look into uh, release this in the future, and eventually we'll be for sure communicating to Twitter, LinkedIn, or in the website. Uh, functionality that could be available. I would say for sure the basic one could be you know creating a new team, editing existing ones, deleting existing ones. Definitely the the most useful ones. But at the moment, as I said still internal. If you want to use it, you need to join us. Excellent. So smooth. yeah, go for it. No, I was just going to compliment the plug. That was smooth. <laughs> I was going to try to ignore it, but well done. You did, you did that. Do that. Um, so we're talking about tools here. So I have a segue on this other way. Bear with me, everybody. Uh, so we meant, talked about picking a tool, deciding what tool we're going to have. I have a question for um, so I just need to quickly check my, um, I guess this is again for, for, for Luke and Marco, you guys were talking about GitHub, um, as, as your choice, uh, for source of truth. How was that met by designers? And, uh, was that sort of, how did you guys decide that GitHub was the place to be? Was it something, did you have any objection from, and I am saying this, and I know that lots of designers use GitHub and I think that's fantastic, but I also know that sometimes GitHub to some designers can be somewhat intimidating yeah it's it's still something that we're like smoothing out um you know but it's an opportunity to you know it's a learning learning opportunity great grow your team upskill with the system as well um you know we try to make it as easy as possible uh like through the plugin that sort of like login like create a pr form you know it's just give give us like, like two bits of data and that create a pr for you uh, and then go through the review process um but, you know, like it's like it comes back to that, like design systems are a people problem. Um, and it's, you know, help your friends out, like just be, <laughs> be a good colleague, essentially, like up, upskill each other. Um, GitHub's not that hard. I think, you know, it's the same with all these sort of major tools. 
like you know everyone cries at looking at Jira for the first time but you know you get you get into it you learn it uh, it's not just yeah. the first time I still cry when I look at Jira I mean I still do yeah I, you know I still can't create a ticket you know that's uh <laughs> you know, get somebody else to do that but you know it's uh you know help each other out I think it's the um the landing there but yeah I, get, I think we went with GitHub because everything else is on GitHub but you get those like things like Circle CI integrated with it really well um but yeah it was kind of like you know a bit of a necessary evil to some degree you could say um but yeah um learn and grow excellent <laughs> thank you so talk about the signers i have a question for yana here uh or, or kath and yana but yana i'm gonna direct this question at you here um i know for a fact that you guys are putting this design system together and i also think that the designers at candy are also looking at something what's the collaboration between you guys and uh the designers uh, and how what does that collaboration look like um that, that's a very good question <laughs> we are trying to um collaborate as much as we can um unfortunately we don't have a, a github uh, plugin but that's a very cool thing to have i guess tell me notes i will i will make sure that designers our designers are using that uh, but we are currently making sure that our documentation is using the same language, the same tokens, as Kat mentioned in the talk. So our designers know what to use, and um, we are using the documentation and the CMS where, where you can just use the um, primary button, secondary button. So the language is the same, where we're using the documents and everything. So the, the designers don't need to like go through multiple Figma files. They can just open the pattern library or composition library and see what is already available for them and what tokens are available. And actually we had that meeting yesterday with our design team, just having a conversation about the tokens and how we are communicating and what's the best way to be able to just speak the same language. So yeah, Kat, do you have anything else to add to this? No, I think Yana, you said everything. We have um, we have biweekly meetings with the uh, product design, but I think uh, that's going to increase now after this meet. I think it's important. Excellent, good. I actually have a follow up question for you guys, uh, which is uh, which which we have had here about path and library. Um, so this is our, uh, the person's asking, basically saying that in their pattern library, they include templates, uh, but it's, it appears from the talk here that it can be you include templates only in Storybook, uh, speaking on tools. Uh, is this more efficient than adding it into your pattern library or, or how come you sort of went for that option? Because our pattern library is not, um, it's a dummy component and our templates are connected to the CMS, as well as uh, they're connected to the documentation. And our product, our business can change the templates. So it works on the segments instead of working just the solid static components. That is why we separated the pattern library, whereas the design team is working very heavily on it uh, in the doc source and the storybook work lives in a completely different library. So the the responsibilities are separated and we can we can iterate much quicker in terms of like how we're maintaining our pattern library and the template sections and the design system itself. Yeah, I just want to add that what Yana said, there is a separation of concerns. So there's a lot of uh, brand specific logic. So business logic um, that it is in the component library, which is storybook. So that's why we have that separation. Absolutely. Excellent. Great. Um, I've got a couple of more questions here. Uh, I'm just going to take a very, very quick uh, uh, look in the chat here. So one of the questions that someone is referring that Joe Banks was asking his design uh, system users to uh, detach components when they needed and let him know so he could potentially improve them. What other good ways are there to get feedback on design system? So we talked a little bit about feedback and about uh, testing, uh, but how are you guys is, is there any other good way when you don't necessarily have direct contact, for example? Yes, go on, Bambi. Um, so back in AutoTrader, um, the designer was part of the design system team, started a, an area called unique instances. And so very often, if someone had built something that may have been composed of some 
existing components, lower level stuff, there was a place related to the design system where you go, look, this isn't yet to be shared, but it relates. And so we need visibility. And then in the design crit, we can go over it and be like, okay, so we've done this it, on this user journey for this reason. Should it be a shared thing? Should, should we promote it? And then it opens up that conversation a little bit more about you want people to solve problems in the right way for their users. And if they have a different twist on something, that's brilliant. You just need that visibility. And so that's that's just one way, but it did seem to work pretty well. Definitely taking notes here. Some really good tips there. Uh, thank you. Um, any other comments on that at all? Uh, yeah, I can try and follow up on that. I think Go for it. it's like um, a little bit, it comes down to culture. And, you know, I try to sort of remember it. There's like an old sort of, um, you know, Nathan Curtis, shout out, Nathan. Every every design system talk needs a Nathan shout out um, around um, like how strict your system is and how flexible it is. Um, and I think there's a level of, um, you know, how strict or flex flexible are you with taking feedback from your consumers? Um, that, you know, sometimes something isn't working and, um, you know, it's as a as a design systems team, it's being able to like take that and change that. I mean, I'm, I'm saying this is somebody that doesn't work on the design systems team. I'm sort of a, I'm not, I'm barely in the consumer these days. I, I sit in an agnostic team that um, sort of provides sort of like strategy and product vision uh, more than sort of like building and using the design system as such. Um, but yeah, it's like going to like our sort of like design clinics that we host weekly. Um, we also host like engineering clinics that Marco sits in. Um, that um you know you get you get feedback you go hey i'm trying this it's not working um and then you know it becomes a, a problem that you solve together um but you know sometimes it's you know you, you're breaking patterns i something just because there's like a level of understanding that you don't have that you know again it's a learning opportunity or it's like this isn't fit for purpose in which case let's reevaluate do we need to like add new properties to this component or do we need to create something new Good, getting a lot of nuts here as well. So all agreement, fantastic. Um, so actually, Dancy, this is a question for you here. Um, how, I, well, I say that, I think this actually is a question for everybody, but we'll start off with you. How may you approach the topic of the science system when interviewing uh, right. and, you know, as a startup or a scaler, but actually in general, sort of what some uh, hot interview tips uh, bring me up to the science system. But let's start with you, Dancy. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I, I personally found I, I was kind of brutally honest about like what I was looking for and and what I was passionate about when when I when I did interview at, um, at startups about this. Um, I think that's important. <laughs> Obviously, it's an odd place to kind of it's an odd kind of place to be selling a design system when you're also trying to sell yourself. But um, like, if that's your thing, if that's your jam, like um, you there's no reason to not to do it you know i think i, I even at one previous company um they they had like a five-step pro process and i actually asked for an extra interview with the head of design even though i was interviewing for an engineering role um so i think you know you just be open and honest about what it is you're looking for and um the yeah if you if you really want to go up along with selling a design system but um like yeah i i, I personally would just think be be brutally honest about what it is you want and and what you're because like I said like it's it, we, these are things that we love and we care about so you don't want to go and and not have that honesty and actually find out maybe it's not the right fit for you. Um, obviously, I'm giving this very much towards kind of the if you're going at a company that maybe hasn't got one yet, like it's probably quite different for large organisations. Yeah, Dancy, you Um, okay, so just to be clear here, so I think I might have not done the question properly just for everybody else. Uh, this is about you going to interview as I am looking for a job at the startup. So for you guys who are being more sort of established organizations, um, what is a good tip for someone who wanted to interview and sort of bring up the science system and, and you know, maybe that's not directly what, what the role is, but I'm super interested and I really want them to know about it. Yes, Dendi. Um... I think there's a lot of properties, again, that like we've talked about the people side of it. It's not, 
it, it doesn't matter whether you're a designer or a developer, right? If you, you need to sell the work in a little bit more, you need to do that real open collaborative piece of engaging with people around you. It's not enough to just whittle away and make a perfect component in whichever discipline you're in. It's trying to make sure that that comms thing and it's really collaborative and you are really good at asking for and dealing with feedback. Um, and that means taking your ego entirely out of the equation and being quite clear that this is for the good of the system and for all of these people. I'm just kind of massaging this thing into shape. And so it's not mine, it's ours. And, and when you get those kind of qualities through an interview about um, how they communicate about their work, how you sell it into stakeholders, you might not have worked on a design system, but that whole kind of thing, you might get in more senior product designers or uh, developers anyway. Those are really, really good qualities. You can divert in the right way, I think. Sorry, I, I've tried to look. I was listening to you. I was looking at the chat and I was trying to find out my mute button. It's all it's all happening here. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so we do have oh, a Jana was, on that. had a hand up, by the way. Could I just, could I just say you. that I am just totally agree with Dante. It, I'm sorry, just like two doubts and I keep forgetting which one is which one. Um, um, I think the building design system and even like when you're coming an interview or anything it's it's not just a job of being a developer or it's not a job of just designing something for the sake of designing it it's being almost like a psychologist a therapist for the whole team for like a lot of developers and like listening to the feedback removing the ego away and just saying let let's chat let's have a conversation let's find out what is required what is needed and how we can make our life easy and simpler it's like how to create that hierarchy and be able to assemble this Lego blocks together. I think that's that's the, the my personal take for that. And yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So I have a few more questions and I am gonna, you guys will all be very excited to hear, but I have saved the big ones for last. So prepare yourself, hold on tight. Uh, so we have been talking about design systems quite often when we talk about design systems and actually in general, whether it's a startup success story or whatever it is, we always talk about the good things and, and how successful and brilliant it is. And Dan, did you obviously cover this in your talk? And But why do design systems typically fail? Uh, what what's, what makes them fail? And I'm going to start with you, uh, Dan, and then we're going to go around the room. Yeah, I mean, it's almost the flip side of what I was talking about before, um, where if you don't recognize that people element of it, which is absolutely fundamental, then in some way you're either not going to get buy-in if you if the projects come from below or if it's come from above, then maybe the requirements aren't understood or, or maybe people aren't supported. Um, maybe not enough listening has been done or, or reaching out. It's like all of those bits are so easily missed, especially if like, oh, design system, I'll read some blogs and try and figure this out. As so many of us we've done at some point in our lives have gone, we just need to do a thing. You're not always going to be aware of all this more ephemeral stuff. And so actually Dan C had most of the answers in his talk, to be fair. So yeah, Dan, you always pick it up, mate. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, like I mean, for for me, um uh it, the biggest problem is either understaffing. Um, or lack of staffing, um, and and if 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 that's not the case, then it tends to be communication, right? Like um, my my personal reason I, I left the startup was that was um, and I put this that was one of the reasons I kind of put this as one of the bright things in my talk was when I said about uh, the agreement, uh, I myself and 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 the leadership had an agreement, but it was very much like a, in a startup you have these conversations, you have these meetings, and we agreed it verbally and it was in everyone's head, but. You know, like I said, things change and, and people change. And if you don't have things documented and written down and stuff and, and places where people can find it and understand, um, which you know is another form of communication. That I mean, in most things in life, right, it's communication where things fail. So talking about failures, uh, I, uh, I, if anybody else has a comment on why the science system fail, I would love to hear that more. But I want to add on another question onto that. What's the sort of biggest success or failure for you people uh, building a design system? Uh, not just, yeah, in general, like what has been the next, I think news, news um, 
especially with you guys, because you are sort of a bit more mature. But let, let, let's let let's start with, um, actually, let's start with Katayana. You are at the early stages and you see what have you been failing so far? And then we can build on for that for more and more mature assistance. Yeah, I, I love this question because there is... Uh, they mentioned that communication and the people could result in a failure, and that's a big thing. They're starting to notice that, okay, we do need another person that's full-time on design system. And I just have to add this, but the design system here at, at Candy wasn't being recognized much by um, by the rest of the company, but me and Yana are selling it like crazy. And now they actually put us on a team called Design System. So I think that's a huge win for us. And yeah, that's a... That's what we're going with. Uh, I think that is worth a shout that just there. Like, congratulations for, for, for getting that team set up. Yes, Yana, please continue. I'll just add because, um, yeah, in Kante, we finally managed to, to be like, um, have a full res responsibility in the design system. But uh, going back to the kind of uh, question of experience of playing the design system and what happened to them, um, I think. Sometimes um, one design system are very tightly coped to the project itself. Um, they fail because the project might not be able to survive if it's a startup. And then if the startup is not be able to continue building the product and be building the design system, then all of the code, all of the work which was done is basically disappearing. And that's happened in my experience. Um, whereas it's kind of a painful experience, but you know, you kind of keep going and the, the idea is of having multiple design systems and multiple different pattern libraries. They are all serving different purpose. And sometimes people are creating the same purpose, the same design systems without thinking what is actually, what the problem they're solving. And I think partially sometimes if you don't know what the problem and how to solve it, and you're just repeating the same issue, the same problems and just repeating the same design systems, then they might most likely they will fail. And the same story with the startups. It's just you need to make sure that you know what we are doing. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Luke and Marco, who are sort of a bit further down the line, what are some uh, failures uh, from, uh, I, I guess, from your team organization that you have come across? Um, well, I mean, you know, we started making a new plugin because the other ones were failing. Um, <laughs> like, be really honest with ourselves. Um, yeah, it's you know, a matter of like learning from your mistakes. Um, you know, like I Dan sort of mentioned earlier, you know, you can you can put put something together within like twenty minutes, and then suddenly you realize that your whole design system's like dependent on some code that you wrote in a weekend to solve a problem. Um, yeah, like it is being able to you know overcome your learnings, uh, admit your mistakes. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, it's hard to know your failures because we're just so good at what we do. Um. <laughs> I, can, I can maybe add one or something that we have really improved since we started. Like when we started building components, uh, at some point we realized maybe the components were not accessible as we wanted. Uh, we are we do aim to hit AA standard accessibility. And once we realized that not everything was really has, as we wanted, we really changed our process, how we were developing how we were reviewing things, how we were testing. And that that for us, I would say maybe was, let's say a failure that we have definitely changed and improved immediately. And was really nice then to see people coming back and say, oh, oh wow, that's actually really good. Yeah, I think like, yeah, like you've kind of said the like news is like quite a mature design system. You know, we're still like only like three or four years old. Like, um, yeah, either we, you know, we, we blitz scale definitely, um, you know, Hide, hide a massive team, put a load of effort in. Um, but then, you know, there's, there's some of those like problems you pick up along the way of just working so fast that, you know, now we are sort of like taking a step back, looking at um, where we can improve. You know, the first the first few years was like all about adoption, uh, you know, get, getting the design system in people's hands, uh, getting feedback, learning from that. Um, and yeah, get, getting that like snowball rolling. Um, but now it's, yeah, like, um, tracking our metrics yeah like Marco mentioned like accessibility making sure that you know we are um hitting that gold standard um and do, doing the best work we can um but yeah it's like we, we're now an opportunity where we can sort of like take a step back reflect a little bit um and yeah like almost like I think you know be exposed to what our mistakes are um 
at that point. I think we're still we're still learning where we're going wrong, um, and that's the exciting thing. Um, but yeah, that's like sort of the next the next few years of news kit is is learning and growing still. Yeah, yeah and I think as I said, you you guys have a more mature design system, but are you absolutely right? You know, you there is it doesn't matter how we draw a design system or anything goes. It, there is still a journey. There's still learning to be done here. Um, Dan, see, I want to get your input on this as well, like w w about your sort of success failures. <laughs> Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I alluded this one earlier, which was like just communication of, of kind of vision. Um, other than that, I think my, my kind of biggest failures um, were have, or have been over time just around like, like again, like the breakdown of trust, basically breaking stuff, right? Like making assumptions that, you know, doing something won't break something and, you know, being totally wrong and just like eroding everyone's trust. Uh, you know, that's that's probably been the hardest learning curve because especially if you're in a small team and, and I don't know, Catherine and Jan have had this, but like when you're in a small team and, and you're the ones really saying this and then, you know, like suddenly you mess up massively, like it's like you are clawing back everyone's opinion on you. Um, yeah, that's probably been the biggest failure for me is just assumption and breaking stuff. It's, go it's going back to how, how difficult that is to build up the trust, but how easy it is mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, break that down. Um, I am going to move forward with another question. Uh, so I thought that was a quite interesting one. So we're going to move with something which is potentially, uh, I guess this is a good play. I'm just looking everywhere. So we haven't missed anyone's questions before we continue. But I think this one is a good one to wrap up on. Uh, is design system as a term, ho hold on tight, one. I told you it's a big one. Is design system as a term broad enough? as they are more product systems due to the nature that they cover process, writing code, organization, etc. Is the design system broad enough? That's a term. Yes, Nancy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that. Um, in, in terms of like when I was saying about education and like people's opinions of design systems, it's definitely something that I've found um, and uh, yeah, I admit as an engineer, like one thing engineers are bad at is hearing the word design and switching off. Um, not all engineers, you know, <laughs> most of the engineers, here, uh, I'm, I mean, no, not most, all the engineers I'm, I'm assuming in this chat and, 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 and listening um, wouldn't do that. But obviously, you know, we all can probably think of some in our heads that would um, because they think design, that's not me and, and switching off. But the tough thing is it, it is all about like Designed like design tokens are, or to the tokens are all about design decisions, right? It's all about documenting design decisions and then surfing those, uh, surfacing, surfing them, surfacing them in a way that, um, you know, engineers and, and other people can use. So, yes and no, like there's arguments for both sides, I'd say. That's Andy. Um, I gotta be honest, I don't think it matters. Um, I think so long as there's consensus over, well, we are calling it this, here's our reasons, and this is what the scope of our system is. You know, you've got your problems to deal with. If, that, if changing the name of something is going to help you along your way, happy days. Um, I think it's quite an elastic term. And I think actually um, the first talk kind of covered that as well, where some people have used them as synonyms when, and maybe one day, they were actually more design system was style guide it's been an evolving piece of language. And so it's not always meant the same thing because our understanding, our challenges to it have kept evolving. And so if you're thinking about that whole end-to-end -end thing, like problem space to live code, that covers a lot. So yeah, I mean, why can't it be a design system, product system, call it what you like. So as long as everyone working on it knows what you're doing. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And the reason I think that was an interesting question to end on, because we actually had a very similar question at our last talk. And it's not the second, it's not the first time. It's, I don't even think it's the second time this comes up. And I just wanted to comment quickly on um, what Dancy mentioned here about using the name design and some people switching off. Um, it is something that I have come across. I have I have seen uh in actually in terms of living in our own organization occasionally when we sort of talk to other people outside um, diff different projects. But what I am really delighted to see as of late is that it's sort of something that has become, I don't want to say acceptable, 
but it is, as you say, uh, then the, it, it turns out that it doesn't really matter because more and more people understand the purpose of it and what it is that we're trying to do with it and that we can all sort of agree on this system, whatever we put before system is actually helping all of us. And uh, on that note, I am delighted to see that we are nowadays having interesting talks that are provided by designers and engineers separately and together. Uh, so on that note, I think you might be right then, Lee. it doesn't really matter as long as we all agree what we have to solve it and that we all agree on what we're working on. Uh, and with that, I want to say a massive thank you to the speakers. Um, I'm going to cut the Q&A here. I'm going to do a very quick wrap up and say thank you to everybody. But uh, thank you so much, speakers. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for your talks. Uh, as we are said to everyone else, so this is a live stream, meaning that it will live on YouTube. You can rewatch it, then you can rewatch the Q&A and the individual talks and go back and have your questions looked up again and whatnot. It's, uh, it's the wonderful world of uh, live stream YouTube. So I say thank you to the speakers and I turn to the audience. We, I have a couple of things before I let uh, all of you go for the evening. Um, I want to thank you to everybody that's tuned in. I want to thank the whole Design System London community. Uh, I also want to say massive thanks to the people that you haven't seen. Uh, we have our community and marketing team here at Waldi who has been working behind the scenes to make sure that uh, we have everything that we need, that I have everything that I need to be able to give this um, hosting today. Uh, so thanks to everyone. Um, before we wrap up, I do have some exciting announcements to make. We are back very, very soon. Uh, I even think that uh, Dan made a little plug of Converse next week, or uh, and it is happening next week. Next week is World Design System Week. If you didn't know it, Google it and check it out. I say Google it. I think we might get a link to it in the chat if you just hang tight. Uh, we also have Converse Conference uh, on next Wednesday. Uh, you might recognize one of the speakers on the lineup because uh, I believe that Dan D is one of the speakers. Uh, you might also recognize some people from this call. I leave that as a nice surprise for you to find out. Uh, I also, we got DSL uh, next meetup, uh, which we are hoping to be back in person. And as I said before, even if we are going to be in person, we are still live streaming it. So everybody across the world from as we have today, from uh, India, from Estonia, from wherever you are, then you are more than able to see that as well. And we are looking to do that uh, towards the end of November, beginning of December, before everything rests up for Christmas. So keep an eye out on the Meetup page. We can already now say that we have our first DSL uh, of 2023 in the pipeline as well, being worked up and cooked up. So keep an eye out for that one as well. Um, we are always looking for speakers. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it doesn't matter if you haven't got experience from before, you are very welcome to join us. Uh, we will post the uh, speaker form. So anyone that's interested, then you can definitely apply. Uh, as I said, you don't have to have experience. Uh, find something around the science system that you think is interesting, that you have come across and experience you have had that you want to share with the community. We welcome it all. So absolutely do uh, make sure that you apply. And we really also want to make sure that we create the best experience for everyone on our meetups, whether they are in person or whether they are online. Uh, so we would love to get feedback. Uh, there is a feedback form link for you to fill out. I think that one should also be appearing. Oh, actually, we have just someone I'm mentioning as well. Don't forget about me. I'm from Portugal. So there are a lot of different uh, countries that we didn't know about. So fantastic. But as I said, we do want to get your feedback as well. So there should be a feedback form appearing as well. So do please uh, spend, spare a little bit of time to fill that out. I also want to say to Dan, he was asking, I think he mentioned in the chat that there might be a survey around hiring or looking for design system roles. Uh, it's a survey not for you to be looking, but actually what the process is around. So yeah, help out with that as well. Um, there's a lot of links for you guys to check out. And obviously, as I said, there's a whole bunch of other talks and meetups from previous uh, from uh, Design System London. So definitely have a look at that. That's it for this uh, meetup. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And we will see you converge next week. And we'll see you at the next DSL in November, December time. All of this will be announced on our meetup page. So join it. And if you're not following us, as I've done before on Twitter, please do. Um, at DSL Cold.
have a lovely evening have a lovely day have a lovely morning wherever you are in the world and we'll see you very soon thank you and out <laughs>